Hey everyone, good evening. I'm Alex Tanner. This is Talking Shop with Outlier Firefighters. I'm here with Corley Moore from Firehouse Vigilance, the weekly scrap, uh, the man, the myth, the legend, kind of in a way here. <laughs> and uh, we're going to be having a really fun conversation tonight, and uh, I'm glad to have you guys with us. So um, just sit back and, and enjoy. So uh, I guess we'll kind of start. So uh, Corley, I know you're a battalion chief, Moore Fire Department. Um, but outside of that, how were you first exposed to the fire service? Uh, Alex, hey, thanks for having me on. I'm super excited. Uh, first exposed to the fire service, I think, um, I don't know if you call it exposure so much as just we, we grew up down the street, like not even a quarter mile on a, on a pretty busy street, uh, a quarter mile from Fire Station 9 in Oklahoma City, 89th Street. And I think that was my exposure was those guys that were out there playing volleyball. They were constantly, it was a busy house uh, and they were constantly rolling. And I think that was kind of, in my formative teenage years, you know, early 11, 12, 13, seeing those. I remember when I first uh, started driving, I drove a Volkswagen Bug, and I loved Metallica. So I was jamming out to Metallica at a, at a very high volume. And I don't know how long I was sitting there waiting to turn into my, my, my driveway, and Engine 9 was behind me, like, with the captain on the thing saying, please get out of the road. Please, please pull to the side of the road. Anyway, uh, so a lot of exposure to them, and I don't need – I, I don't think I don't know if I know how much it impacted uh, like seeing them and saying, wow, that's cool. So it was no family uh, tradition of it or anything like that before me or anything. Uh, it was just I thought it was cool. And then that just kind of grew into you getting involved. And, and so obviously I'm, I'm from Illinois and a lot of the people that I've had on my show are from Illinois. And uh, I know, uh, you know, you're not. <laughs> So, like, is the fire service, is the way up the same? Is it different? Uh, we, you know, we have a lot of volunteer where you can kind of start paid on call, paid on premise, volunteer. And that's kind of your way to get in, get your certifications. Um, are, are, was that kind of your start or did you work for more and more was where you started and that's where you've been the whole time? Well, I'll qualify first by saying I'm much like you. I know Oklahoma. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know any. You know, well, I'm, I've learned. I shouldn't say I don't know because I've learned a lot as I've traveled. But uh, initially, I didn't know. The, the no, I think it's very two distinct things: the the volunteer and the uh, the paid. Because I, I think they're both can be professional, but definitely two distinct things in Oklahoma. Uh, to get on, you you get on wherever you can. Uh, some of them are combination, but m mainly it is get on wherever you can. And there are definitely stepping stone departments that I mean, that's not a knock on them or anything, but they're the ones you get on and then you try to promote and or promote, you try to move on and get on to other departments and they know they're stepping stones and they try to improve, but absolutely. I was very fortunate in the fact that I got on more um, very early when I was 20 years old and I've never worked for a different one. Awesome. I got on it right when it became, it went, it, it, Basically, Moore got tired in the late 90s of being a stepping stone department, and their their city management and their chiefs said, no, we're not going to be that anymore. We're going to be one of the premier. And they they did over the last – over the cor basically over the course of my career, nothing to do with me has become one of the premier departments to work at in the area. Awesome. I, I think that that's going to be another shift that happens here. It sounds it, – so my dad started uh, 88, I believe. Okay. Hired one place, worked there for 30 years. Now he's moved to another place, but still – uh, you know, he did 30 years there and he had really nothing else. I mean, he worked part time for a little place, I think, for a very short time because his right. brother did. Um, but now it seems like, you know, people in my generation, uh, you worked a place to maybe get hired. But now that there's all the hiring and, and staffing shortages, maybe we're going to see that again where somebody gets on at 20 and that's it. And, right. and they're there. Uh, and it's it's pretty cool. Uh, do you feel like um, how how long into your career? Uh, did you start? Because obviously you're kind of a citizen of the fire service world. I mean, that's 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 who you. I, I believe who you are. I mean, you reach out to a lot of people. You get to speak to people. How um, long into yeah. your career did you kind of shift towards that? Oh, this the firehouse visual started 2018. So it's it's been, it's the last five years. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's when I started it, and uh, it, it, I say started it, but the germs of it were probably only a few years before that, 2016. I got to see Mark Von Oppen come and teach a leadership class here in Oklahoma. It had a huge impact on me. Yeah. Like, so, and and that's a whole story in and of itself because I've not always been um, passionate and plug I've always been passionate, 
I've not always been appreciative of how important this job is. That's, I mean, I think a lot of people have um, ups and downs, or maybe they don't oh, realize yeah. that right throughout their career. So, um, when when did you realize you were you were going to get plugged in and, and make that shift? Was there like I think a was, moment? I don't know if there's a specific moment because I've always I've always loved being a firefighter. Like I, even even back in the day when I, I can remember sitting in the back seat of the car before I was a driver, you know, before I just passenger in my, my parents' car, looking up at the red truck and seeing the guys riding backwards in those open cabs, those Pierce arrows and things like that, going, "That's got to be so freaking cool." They're just rolling around town and everybody's looking at it. Man, that's so cool. So I've always loved being a firefighter. I've been connected to that. Now I have not always been. Um, plugged into the job in, in a, in a top tier, love the standard, push the standard, uh, be ready. The, 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 basically the, the message that I preach, it's not always been the case with me. And that's one of the, I think it's a strength, uh, that I talk to people about is because I have a high empathy. You know, my, the byline of firehouse vigilance is the never ending fight against complacency. And, and the truth of the matter is this, I have a high empathy for people who have fallen into complacency because I've been there. I have been completely enthralled and in the throes of complacency saying hey when we show up for work the the people that win are the is whoever can do as the least amount as possible today and that's complacency at its finest yeah. and but it, it complacency doesn't care who you are it will grab you and it will drag you down into that recliner and you will say you will start saying stuff like not my emergency or i get paid the same whether i go on a call or not and that's the mindset that that starts making sense when you get in complacency but i've been there so I understand it. Yeah. And I, I think a lot of people in departments like ours, right, a couple stations, under 100 people, right, uh, it's easy for those messages to kind of not make its way in, right, where you're supposed Absolutely. to be better or that we have a higher standard in those things. And uh, so a, li- a lot of what's happening now in the fire service is pretty uh, exciting. You know, your show and really a lot of the other things that exist out there on op and touring all, all these these individuals. oh there's so many giants so right. many amazing people so and, many so many great messages yeah we we had frank viscuso come out just near us yeah uh, and and he was in oh, a, really? a, 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 or pretty much right in our backyard right and right. that didn't happen uh, maybe it did i don't know uh, it but it seems like right now there's a lot of kindling on the fire and it's really starting to burn and these messages are making it in the right places which is pretty awesome to see no, it's amazing. I don't think, of course, it, it probably everybody says this. I don't think there's a better time to be a part of the American Fire Service as far as if you if you want to be plugged in, there are more opportunities than there has ever been. Yeah. So yeah, for how horrible social media is for us, it's pretty good. No, the, the the plus side I think way outweighs the downside. I really do. Now that doesn't mean there's no downside, but the plus side is definitely more advantageous if you're plugged in and want to take advantage of it. Yeah. So throughout you growing up through more and and getting to where you are now as a battalion chief, um, what, what kind of taught you about culture? Who taught you about fire service culture? Was that internal? Did you, uh, find, again, we talked about Von Oppen, but throughout the course of, you know, early on in your career, the influence, uh, who taught you what fire service culture is supposed to be? Man, uh, I love my department. I do. I do. But there was a time when our department had a, had a very, um, I don't want to say bad culture because that's not the right term. They, their culture was shaped by a fight that was different than the fight that, that, I, that the newer generation took on. Their fight was trying to get decent pay, trying to get rigs that didn't break down, trying to get stations that didn't leak and have mold throughout them. You know what I'm saying? Completely different fight. And so those people, the, 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 the generations that came before me fought to get decent pay rigs that actually ran, you know, SCBAs that weren't 30, you know, weren't first generation, yeah. uh, bunker gear that, that actually met the stand. There were so many things that they, that I got to inherit that I didn't have to fight for. So then I could look around and say, Hey, uh, we, we don't train enough or, you know, but that, that wasn't their fight. And, and I think what happened at, you know, and I think this happens a lot of places is the passionate people fought for what they needed and then the next generation comes in and takes for granted everything that was fought for and then says, you guys haven't done enough. Or, or at least that's the, that may not be what they say, but that's the message that the older guys receive. And the older guys are like, you know what? Screw you, kid. You have no idea what we've been through. And, and that kind of feeds fuel to that fire. Uh, so anyway, exposure to the culture. 
there was a time at the Moore Fire Department when the culture was whoever could do the least amount of work in the day won. And the goal of your career was to get shipped to the slowest station so that you could do the least amount. And if you did that, you won. And that was the culture. And I, 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 I'm not uh, judging it or, or throw it, but that was the way it was. And that's shifted over the last few years, again, because they won the fights that allowed the fight to shift to now we need to be better at training. We need to be better at being prepared because you, you hit the nail on the head earlier when you said like, I, there's a thing that I, I talked to Scott Thompson about um, and it's a, it's a keynote or it's a speech or it's a class. We're not quite sure, but we discuss it all the time when we get together and it's called, I am the American fire service. And it is the suburban firefighter that works at a, you know, small jurisdiction, low number of stations, under 100 people, and actually approaching 100 is actually a bigger department. Uh, but they make they make limited fires throughout the year. They, they're not job town. And that is the American Fire Service. And the truth of the matter is this, and this is what a lot of people won't say, but it's the truth, is that 95% of those people will go through their careers and probably never make a grab personally. And so the question becomes, and, and so when, when, when that's the reality, how do you stay plugged in? How do you, how do you train? How do you get out there and put in the reps when, when those people aren't really wrong, but you know that they're wrong, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Cause it's a mindset. It's a mindset of, I may never take the test, right? The test may never come, but I'm going to be ready. I'm going to study every week like the test is this Friday. Friday comes, no test. I'm going to study every week like the test is this Friday. Friday comes, no test. And can you keep that can you keep that intensity up for a career? And that cuz that's tough, man. That's complete. That's why complacency is so strong because the test never comes for 95% of the people. Yeah. And so that's a, that's a tough one, man. It really is. Oh, I don't know if I even touched on the question. No, no, you're you got... fine because that was a thing we were going to talk about anyway. And so I'd love to keep going on that. So yeah. uh, we're, I think one of the struggles a lot of people have when they, they go out, they take a class, they go to a conference, they, they listen to a podcast episode, whatever it might be, and they're, and, and it just sparks, right? And they get it, and, and it right. makes sense. And they know it's right. And, and it's something that I struggle with too, so I'm almost kind of speaking first person here. But right on. you know it's right. But then you have a whole group of people telling you that that's not right. Yeah. And is, is that something – it sounds like maybe it is that you've experienced. And how do you get through that? How do you get to the end where you don't, you don't shun those people because you still got to work with them but still you know, stick to your guns but try to bring them along with? How, what, what advice would you give somebody for that? Oh, brother, that's a great, that's like the number one question always posed to the scrap in some way, <laughs> no. super form. No, 100%. And it's like – Again, I'll, I'll reference Scott Thompson because uh, I've said on uh, quite a few now uh, question panels, you know, on the same, which is an honor, by the way, in and of itself to sit on a panel next to Scott Thompson uh, and fielded questions from the audience. And invariably, like one of the top questions is basically some form of the question you just asked, you know, what do you do with the unmotivated? How do you do you alienate? Do you try to bring them along? Do you get drunk down by them? Do you try and drag them up? You know, and all these, and I, I'm telling you right now, Hey, find the answer to that question, write the book. And it's a bestseller period, you know? And I, I I'm, that's not my cop out answer. Cause there is, I do, I've thought about this a lot and there is an answer to it. And it, not that it's elegant or anything anybody wants to hear, but I'm a huge fan of Stephen Covey, the seven habits of highly effective people. Yeah. And it, at the end of the day, it comes down to that circle of influence and the mm -hmm. circle of concern. And the circle of concern will include all those mutts, all the people that aren't plugged in, the, the lackadaisical, those who have fallen into complacency, uh, hell of a good fireman that have fallen into, into the rut uh, and bought into, hey, I'm just going to hold this recliner down. And that doesn't make them bad people or anything like that, but they're in your concern. But they're not in your sphere of influence. And if you spend your energy out here, I promise you, you'll be ineffective. And it's not my philosophy. This is all Kobe, 100%. Yeah. But if you spend your time in that area where you have influence, and if you're a probationary firefighter, that may just be you, you, what you can do throughout the day in your limited free time when you're not scrubbing toilets, you know, or insert whatever. But if you spend that time, if you're just, I say just, don't ever, uh, yeah, you understand what I'm saying. If you're a firefighter, it may be just you and your schedule on the day. If you're a company officer, it may be you only control your crew 
and you can't help all the SOPs, policies, rules, and procedures that don't allow you to do everything you would like to do, but you can control your crew. Um, and if you're a battalion, you can only control your battalion. You may not be able to affect the entire department. And, but if you focus, and, I, and this is a true, this is like a law of, I don't want to say nature, but a law of human existence. If you focus on your what you can control, that influence will grow. And so, anyway, that's the, I don't want to say it's a cop-out answer, no, but it, it's the it's the only one I found that's effective. I mean, it's something, again, the, the passionate struggle, right? That That's yeah. that's what I think, that's what we, we deal with on a regular basis. And, and uh, if you are struggling with that, you know, it's okay, you know, uh, we I, all, no. to have your ups and downs, to, to question whether you're right or wrong. I think that's one of the things that people they're looking for a sense of belonging. They're looking for someone in the fire service to say, this is right. And and I think there are people that have those messages that are right. Uh, but it's kind of one of those faith things, right? You go back home, you got to trust in your beliefs and the things that you've learned, maybe from those people or yourself and find a way to stay on the path. Maybe it's testing you to continue on that. Absolutely. Path. Absolutely. And it is a test. And I, and I love Nick Ledeen and I reference him. I think I reference him in my, I say, I reference him in my book, the nine L I reference him every time I teach the class, I reference him in almost, I love Nick Ledeen up there, Eau Claire, Wisconsin. And he's part of firefighter rescue survey, hell of a guy. And he wrote an article and he always laughs at me. He's like, I, I don't even know where you found that article. It's such an obscure article, but he wrote an article called 30 years for 30 seconds. And he wrote it for fire engineering, I believe uh, in 2016. And it's, it's a phenomenal article, man. It just asks the question, do you have what it takes? to stay plugged in for a 30 year career, stay plugged in and be at the top of your game for a 30 year career. When once, maybe twice, maybe never you get a chance in a 30 second window to save a human life. And, and brother, that's a powerful question. But if you can focus on that, you know, and focus on, man, I can, I will, then it can push you. And I, but that doesn't make it easy. No, no, I, you, we got, we got people timestamp, right? <laughs> Amen. Like in the in the chat here, and guys, I should say too, uh, um, I'm I'm just one guy, so it's hard for me to keep track of the chat sometimes. So I'm gonna do my best with this, but uh, yeah, uh, you're speaking the absolute truth, and and it, and it resonates for sure. So, uh, so stepping back, kind of into the beginning of your career, right? Um, I, I'm a big believer in recognizing people early in your career that maybe you didn't get a chance to acknowledge or maybe now you realize the influence they have. And a lot of people have actually gotten to talk on the show, which makes it even more fun. But um, who influenced you earliest uh, or who influenced you the most early in your career that's still kind of resonating with you today? Oh, brother, I, that, uh, easy answer for me is Scott Lance, um, period. Like uh, Scott Lance was the most influential firefighter in my life. Uh, he was a father figure, you know, <laughs> we joke about it now, but he was a father figure. Not that I had a, I had a, I had an unbelievably good father, but I hired on the fire service at 20 years old and I found my fire fighter father, you know, in Scott Lance. And he was a, he was a badass hack swinging, hose slinging, uh, firefighter. He was a Lieutenant when I hired on, which is a driver in our organization. He was a driver when I hired on, I was assigned to him pretty early cause he had to straighten me out because. I might have had some issues as a rookie. Um, and uh, But long story short, when he was a driver, I was his firefighter. When he promoted to company officer, I promoted shortly thereafter and became his driver. When he promoted to battalion chief, I, I was his company officer on his battalion. And when he retired, I took his spot as a battalion chief. We were connected at the hips for, uh, I want to say, 19 years. And he was, without a doubt, one of the the most influential people in my uh, firefighter life and my life. So that's amazing. Have that long of somebody connected. Uh, I mean, that's, that's incredible. Uh, those people are really important, uh, exponentially important. I think for all of us in our growth, right. Over the course. No, of absolutely. And, uh, yeah. But no, uh, I, I, I remember like, there's so many things that I don't even think, I don't even know if he knows some of these stories. Uh, early on in my, when I was a rookie, I, I, one of our chiefs had a contract where he, he went and mowed the uh, yards of uh, the city that were overgrown. 
it was a terrible job. There's these nasty yards that are just filthy. And the the contraptions we mowed them with were were like out of Mad Max because these heinous yards. But anyway, it was a job. And I worked with it with Scott Lance. He was one of the people that, that worked this job with me. And I remember when I was a rookie, we were driving along in this uh, like 1987 Chevy 1500 uh, dragging a mowing trailer. And we were having a discussion. He said, why do you want to be a firefighter? You know, it was a typical question. And I answered, I was like, man, I've wanted to be a firefighter since I was a kid. Right. And he said this to me and I still remember to this day, he said, Oh, you're one of those. Right. And it hit me because I'm, again, I'm 20 years old at this time. And, and I looked up to this guy immensely. Uh, and I was like, no, I'm not one of those. I'm not one of those at all. You know, no, I, you know, I just meant it like everybody is like wants to be a firefighter when they're a kid, but it, it, it really had an impact on me. And it's one of those things that stuck with me to this day. Like, I don't think he meant it in the way that it came across to me as a 20 year old. Cause it really did affect me where I was like, this, this, this is just a job. This ain't nothing special. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and so I'm very, very careful about the words because of that interaction. And I don't say that in a bad way because that man, 100%, is my mentor, my idol, my uh, uh, guy that drove me, uh, kept me on the straight and narrow and straightened me out many times. Uh, so I don't want to downplay, but that, I, I, that innocuous conversation in that cab, I still remember to this day and how much it affected me in my approach to the job for many years. I think that's important. That's why I ask about learning about culture early on. I'm, I mean, I'm fortunate enough. I, I grew up around it because of my father, and, and I got a different lens than I think a lot of other people get, right? That's a very fortunate experience that I got to have uh, where a lot of those things were built into me anyway, right? Right. And a right. lot of people don't get that opportunity. So uh, do you guys, do you, do you maybe, uh, on your shift even, do you pick out, you know, uh, opportunities to educate on firefighter culture and, and build those things in people. Is that a regular thing for you? I, I control my battalion and, and, and I don't get me wrong. I have ebbs and flows of passion and energy because it's, it's, I'll tell you this is that, that staying plugged in takes a lot of energy like it does. And it's exhausting if you, especially if you can't find ways to recharge your batteries. One thing that I have very lucky to me is the network of things like the vigilantes where I get my, my batteries recharged, the scrap, traveling around and meeting uh i'm i'm super blessed where i go to conferences and speak but the people i speak to are like the top five percent so i get this completely skewed version of the fire service sometimes you know because it's the it's the badasses that i get to talk to uh but um no absolutely i think you have to you either build a culture on purpose that embraces it or you just take what you get and what you get um Von Oppen, I'll reference him again. He said, he, I don't know where, you know, exactly. It's people like water. They sink to the lowest level they're allowed to. And uh, there's exceptions to that, obviously. But I, I, I firmly believe that. And I, I think that if you, every place I know, who said it? Man, I'm trying not to butcher the quote. I'm pulling a blank on it. But I'm sorry. I'll get back okay. to it. It was uh, uh, Bobby Eckert. And he says, if you embrace firefighter culture, firefighters will come out of the woodwork for it. And, and it's just, it's true. If you embrace firefight, people join this job because they want to be badass fire. No one joins this with very few exceptions. Very few join this job wanting to do as little as possible. Most of them, even the, even the, the ones who've lost their way, most of them wanted to be a badass firefighter at one point, but they got disillusioned. They got disenfranchised. They got disengaged and lost their way. They, in Scott Thompson's words, they were allowed to drift towards failure. But when you embrace fire service, a fire first culture, man, when you embrace mastering the basics, why, why would I want to stretch a hose? Why would I want to throw a 24 foot? You can't do that. You know, you get these, these people saying these things because if you take those and you take those and you take the bandwidth it takes to figure out how to do that off the table, your bandwidth is amazing no matter what's coming at you. And, and, and when you can get people to buy into that message, mastering the basics, then they'll pull hose all day long. You know, because it's about being so good that you don't have to worry about it when the time comes when it matters. Absolutely. Uh, as as a battalion chief, and I don't know if your rank structure works very simple. I mean, you're you're a shift commander, right? Over over the yes, right, in essence, yes. And um, uh, four companies, four companies, twenty two people per shift. Yeah, 
There you go. All right. Yeah, uh, for us, they, they have battalion chiefs in other departments. Ours are captains, I guess, technically. But We were assistant chiefs forever, but the, no one else calls them that. Really? So it's just weird. So we finally went to battalion chiefs. They were trying to move us, uh, ours, and I don't know if it'll ever happen, from captain to battalion chief for that reason. Because they are. I mean, they run the shift. Um, when, when you took over, and, and obviously you took over for your mentor, so that's pretty awesome to begin with. But um, – what things have you done to kind of toe the line then with that culture to keep those things and grow towards the future? Uh, obviously, you're not a clone <laughs> of your mentor, but like, uh, what have you done? You know, oh, brother, chief? man. Uh, I, you can, it would probably be a better question for my battalion and the guys on it, honestly, <laughs> because I tell them all the time. I, I, I actually, you can ask them this. This is a quote. I apologize to them and say, look, guys, I'm sorry. I'm your battalion chief, so you got to put up with this. There is so much stuff that we do. Uh, a, I'm a huge reader. You know this. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, if you've read uh, The Culture Code, one of my favorite books, everybody get The Culture Code, read The Culture Code, embrace The Culture Code, and do everything it says. But Daniel Coyle talks about language. Language is so, so, so important, man. You create a language for your culture, and then you use that language on purpose. Now, other people on the outside look in and see this language and see the the the, the nicknames and the whatever you want to call it, the language. I can't think of a better word yeah. than that. And they're like, that's fuck. That's hokey. Sorry. That's, okay. that's hokey. That's BS, whatever. Uh, but if you're on the outside, of course it's hokey. Of course it seems corny. You know what I'm saying? But when you're on the inside, it's just normal. It's just normal. And it's, and, and you don't even realize this, but it happens in the, in the, in the American fire service that you got jobs and Jake's and uh, you know, language that we use that to everybody else, they don't even know what we're talking about, but it's a lingo. It's a jargon. It's a, it's Nick, it's all of it. And it builds so much culture in esprit de corps, but language and Daniel Coyle really drives this point home, create a language for your people. The other thing is, is a vision. You have to have a vision and it doesn't have to be grandiose or anything like that, but you have to over communicate it from the top down 100%. And the vision of green shift, C shift, my battalion is we are going to be a very strong team very good at what we do. Right. And that's, I I could go into how much time you got. Cause I do a lot of corny stuff, man. I went, (laughs) go for it. And it's not me. It's not me. My guys are amazing. My guy, my people are amazing. And, but I went and bought the, there's a box you can buy on Amazon. There's a lots of them, but it's a, it's a box of value cards and it's just blank white cards that have a value written on them. Honesty, integrity, loyalty, hard work, trust. It's like 300 words. You know, there's 300 of these values. And what we did was we laid them all out on the ground in the day room, you know, so it was like a 15 by 20 grid of all these values. And then everybody got a three by five card on the shift and they had to write down at least three that were their personal values, like personal values, what drove them in life. And I explained my values, you know, I'm so important about it, autonomy, decisiveness, and, and what was important to me. I probably wouldn't do that again because I feel like me explaining it first kind of, colored what people put down but that's not the point so everybody wrote down at least three up to five and they had to prioritize what are your top three or five in your life you know and then i took those cards and i uh basically did an aggregate of them i put them in a word cloud so that the biggest the ones that repeated were really big and the ones that were you know all the way down to the ones that were only put in once were tiny but what that did was right there in the middle of the whole thing was this giant word respect it was crazy. You know, everybody like, like out of everybody, that was like the word that was repeated over and over. Like 90% of the people put down respect or uh, uh, some word that meant respect. And then the next set of words was all teamwork or, or loyalty or working together or cooperation, you know? And so when you looked at them and I talked to everybody and we talked about this and I said, basically what this tells me is we all want to be a very strong team that respects each other. It's just a strong team. And then all the rest of them were competence and uh, excellence, you know, or synonyms of those. And so that, that created the, the mantra of a strong team or a, a, yeah, a strong team, very good at what we do. And that's our, that's what drives us. That's awesome. So if you run everything through that lens, it's like, why are we out here doing this drill? Because we're a strong team and we're very good at what we do. That's why, you know, it answers the question. Yeah, I, I'm currently actually that's the book that I'm reading right now is Culture Code. So I'm I'm right in there with. You. I think I saw you posted that. I yeah. was going to mention something about it because I love that book. Oh man, man I, it's I've been meaning to read it. And and one of the things was the belongingness, the culture, creating a culture of belongingness. And what better way to do that than in, ask your own people 
what they want out of the shift or out of the group. I mean, that's... no. And there are times when I when I drop the ball and I don't push it as hard as I should or reinforce it because it all comes down. Man, I, I can't explain this enough. I mean, I can't express this enough. It comes down to the leader reinforcing it and over communicating it. And Coyle talks about it in the book. It's like ninety seven percent of leaders think that their people know that their values that drive the organization, but when you actually interview them and ask them what they are, like three percent of them or something. I, I get the percentages wrong, but. They, they're completely off base because they you have to over communicate it and over communicate it and drive it home. And if you do that and then the other things we do. So uh, we you, you work the same shift as me. So you work uh, three Tuesdays in a row and then you're off for nine Tuesdays. Right. Oh, wait. No. What do you mean? I don't like this week you work Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So the next week you'll work Wednesday, Friday, whatever, Sunday. Yeah. And then you'll work Friday, Sunday. So if you look at a calendar, you'll work three Tuesdays in a row and then be off for six Tuesdays or nine Tuesdays. Six oh, no, Tuesdays. we're not like that. No. Uh, okay, never mind that. We're every third day. So, oh, my God. Now you're going to make me pull up my calendar because my brain's fried here. But <laughs> That's what we do here. That's how, that's how Crowley works. <laughs> oh, <laughs> admittedly, we, we are working a lot because we're, we're short step. Anybody wants no doubt. A, anyone wants a job. We... <laughs> well, I can, pull up, I can pull up my calendar here. Yeah. And and I don't know if you can. Yeah, it's hard to see. Yeah, we, yeah. Gla- glare. But basically, long story short is we work three Fridays in a row and then we'll be off for six Fridays. Huh. So every nine Fridays will be the last Friday that we work. So basically, long story short, I didn't want to do something that was once a tour, but I didn't want to do something that was once a month because our schedule hits so wonky throughout the month. Yeah. So I came up with this thing where it's called Tactical Tuesday. And that's where we do multi-company drills on the last Tuesday that we work. And it hits every nine weeks. And it's a phenomenal thing. It's amazing, man. Um, then we had walk through Thursdays. So whenever our third final Thursday hit every nine weeks, we the, the crews would get together and they would present a walkthrough that they'd done uh, in their district of a high hazard occupancy. And they would present it to the rest of the crews. So A, the first new crew got eyes on a building that was a high hazard. And then B, all the other crews got exposed to it by proxy through the uh, through the presentation. And the really cool part was the the crews uh, grabbing a hold of these walkthroughs and the young kids with their PowerPoint skills and putting drones in the air and using Google. It was crazy how crazy how good these uh, walkthroughs got. That's awesome. Uh, that, but that's the that's the corny stuff that I do. And I've done stuff that's failed also. Um, now one thing, uh, lots of stuff is good. We do line of duty death uh, studies. So every, we have four stations. So once a year, each station has to do one. So it's basically once a quarter. Um, and it's it's crazy how much they take a hold of these things and and run with them. So every once a quarter, one of the stations has, and it's every year they have to do it. Now, we've only done it, albeit for one year. So there's been four of them. But we'll see how this next year goes on the repeat. But I'm telling you, it was great. Uh, the station three, they actually called Jeff Cool, and he zoomed in. And talk to the station about Black Sunday. Wow! I mean, how crazy is that? The, the guys put that together. You know what I'm saying? And they're and of course they're trying to outdo each other. Yeah. You know, it, it was great. We they went over the Charleston Nine. They went over. I mean, it was, uh, it was a really cool thing. But the crazy part is they took a hold of it and yeah. ran with it. That's in our. Uh, so we we borrowed a little bit of stuff, and I wasn't there from the ground up. I've been helping with it. Uh, one of our, one of our lieutenants. Uh, he redid our probationary like book and we used to do right. a checkbox right and it was you throw the ladder to proficiency this many times signatures check boxes all that crap right we, we wiped a lot of that stuff and i think he pulled it from crew first culture which is jeremy sanders right and um he we we do in their first i think it's six months they've got to do presentations so one of the presentations they do is a line of duty one of the presentations nice. they do is like a uh, department improvement thing uh, and, and these were little things kind of in what you're talking about was to get them engaged and get them locked into something, almost kind of tricking them into being a, a student of the fire service. And it's been really cool. That was not what my probation was like. I didn't have a horrible probation by no. any means, but like it was, it's very interactive now and kind of oh, it's creating awesome. a culture of belonging. That's what we're trying to, I think, do. Um, I'm going to well, touch. And, and, oh, go, ahead. go ahead. Go ahead. No, no. Oh, I was yeah, just going to jump into the chat because there were some, some yeah. kind of questions. So uh, first thing first, John McCoy. Yes. Uh, uh, please ask questions. It's totally interactive. 
Uh, I should have said that before, but I motor mouth right through the intro. So, yes, uh, and I will get to your question here in a second, too. Uh, Chief Leidig, we did not uh, acknowledge, and, and we need to for a second here, the two brothers that were lost in uh, Newark mm. last night. And uh, I, truthfully, I have not gotten to research a ton other than that it was on a ship, and I don't really know a lot yet, and I don't really know what's been posted, but I know we did lose two brothers there, so... Um, yes, uh, I absolutely want to acknowledge that here on you know on the show and and, and beyond, right? Um, but back to John McCoy's question. So he's asking uh, Corley, uh, how has it been seeing your son grow up and become that badass firefighter, and how he deals with it? And uh, you picked one of the questions right out of my list, and I'd love to talk about multi generational stuff. Absolutely. Sure. Uh, I'm very new to it, first of all, because my son's about to celebrate his second year on the job. Uh, very, very, I, I, I can say this, I'm extremely proud of him. He was never someone that was going to be a firefighter growing up. You know, that, that was never on the radar. It wasn't like he grew up with me as his dad saying, I'm going to be a, I'm going to be a firefighter like that. Uh, he basically turned 18 and came to me and me and his mama and said, uh, Hey, I think I'm going to try out for firefighting. That was out of the blue. Now I will say this. I always told Amanda, his, his mom, my wife, uh, I always told her, uh, he's screwed. Like he's going to be a firefighter. And she's like, what do you mean? I'm like, cause he's going to get a real job, you know, the real world. And he's going to be like, what do you mean? I have to work tomorrow or when, when's nap time. When do I get to go lift weights? I don't understand. What, what do you mean you want me to work? <laughs> I don't understand. So uh, that was always the running joke, but no, uh, it was a, I, I, someone asked me the other day. In fact, I was on, uh, the, I'm pulling a blank. Zam and Janelle. Oh, sorry. Um, but anyway, I, they asked me this, the question, who's your hero? And I, I had to think, I had to think for a while, but I said, honestly, I'm going to go with the first thing I said is my son. My son is my hero because his, his journey to become a firefighter was not an easy one. You know, I, I tried out once and made it on just through sheer dumb luck uh, and God's blessings, basically. And I always tell people, it happened on, on purpose. God made sure I was a firefighter on purpose because I was supposed to be a firefighter, but I was never the person that was going to try out 50 times to get on. Right. I was just a, a an irresponsible 20 year old who made it on. And, and, but that was the way it was supposed to be, but he stuck to it, man. I don't know how many times he tried out, but he stuck to it. He made it. And I'm so, so, so proud of him. Now he gets to make his own path. And now he has to put up with me being his dad. And, uh, I can only imagine the crap he has to put up with, you know, but he's, he's a badass. He really, he really is. Yeah. So. I, I can speak from that perspective. Cause my dad, you know, my dad's the right. chief. Yeah. The and, chief. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's interesting. Luckily, you know, I, I work in an area that's a little bit farther from him, so it wasn't quite as well known, but my uncle was also a battalion chief uh, before he retired and everybody knew I, I've kind of learned that from what I've experienced and talking to other chiefs, kids or, or, or kids that have grown up in the fire service, right? I think the parents that don't over push it, don't overly tell them and give them ideas young, I think they're more successful, right? They go seek answers, right? They, they, uh, that my dad did that for me. He just put me with people that made sense when I would have come and ride along or something like that. It's not like him and I sat down at the dinner table at night and went, all right, Alex, this is when you pull a two and a half. Like, right. that's not what happened. <laughs> And but there are firefighter families that are like that. And, no, there are. And I think that that's one of the most beneficial things that you could do for a uh, a second gener or a multi generational firefighter, right? Uh, uh, Chief Lighting wanted to uh, throw this your way too. Here he says, "Do lost fires." Uh, he says, "Corley, do the lost fires." Uh, they just did Hackensack, New Jersey, and so many candidates were absolutely clueless to that fire. So no, it's it, yeah. The, you, he's a hundred percent, hundred percent accurate. The, the the amount of lost lost fires is a great way of saying it because we just don't address them enough. And, and, and the attention span of, I don't want to just pick on younger generations, but the attention span of modern society has shrunk down to the point of like, I see, I see real, I even created a reel the other day that had like 0.4 seconds of showing a picture of chief Ike. And I'm like, how is this even a thing where it's a, <laughs> uh, the attention span is just shrunk down that, yeah. that tiny. I'm not so, but no, he's he's <laughs> chief chief lighting 100 on point with the the lost fires 100. We have to, and this was like a Rick uh, Lasky talks about it. The why? Why don't the younger generations understand the why behind a lot of it? And a lot of the why behind it is 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 the history, the 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 history, 
and the traditions and why they exist and which ones we should hold on to and cherish and which ones we should honor, but also let go. And it's, it's a powerful, powerful thing. Yeah. Uh, I, we, in one of the, uh, vigilante, uh, forums that we had and I, we should, I just realized we haven't really acknowledged what that is and we could talk about that in a second, <laughs> but, um, you had Scott, if you know, you know, on, and, uh, and, and he talked to us about, and he's obviously big on culture, wrote the book literally. And, um, I, I asked him a question about connection to the macro culture that everyone's got a culture, right? But, um, uh, I think a lot of people aren't connected to that macro culture of the fire service, exactly what we're talking about. Right. And I think you're leading a horse to water here. Talk about it, right? Talk about the history. Talk about all those things. I think then young people latch on immediately, right? They just got to hear about it. And we don't talk about it that much. No, 100%. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, 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 all right. Hold them back. Go ahead. No. I don't want to go on a rant. I don't want to go on a rant. I'll, I'll save the rant. I'll save you the rant. rant away. I don't. <laughs> come on. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's good. It's good. I'll, it'll come, I'm sure. Uh. So throughout you going through, well, let, let's talk about firehouse vigilance. Uh, okay. Uh, let's talk about the weekly scrap, that, and then the vigilantes component now that's growing, and, and I'm a member of it, and it, it's it's amazing, but let I'll let you do the talking, not me. Okay. Oh, yeah, you're better at it. I mean, it's not, no. <laughs> uh, no, uh, firehouse vigilance was initially me. As you know, I'm a, I'm a huge reader. I read, I read, read, read. I love reading. I love reading, but... Um, I wanted to share all the stuff I was reading. So I started writing articles initially and, uh, uh, some Russian hackers actually took down the original firehouse vigilance, uh, site. Like they really did. I had a good collection Would someone would make an awesome post on Facebook. I would reach out to them and say, Hey, would you care if I shared this as an article on firehouse vigilance? They'd be like, yeah, go for it. And I would format it up and ship it. But anyway, uh, I was very frustrated with the fact that it wasn't growing, you know, like typically anybody who's starting something and it's not going as fast as they want it to. And my wife actually uh, asked, why don't you go live on Facebook? And I was like, cause that's stupid. That's why. And, and so, but that was the original was just taking my articles. The original idea behind the scrap was a, it was scraps. It was leftovers. It was something you threw away. So that's why it's called the scrap. And it was also something to fight about. So scrap, but, um, and it was just me talking like this without you here, just me talking. And it was terrible, not terrible, but it was just like me going over some points. And accidentally, uh, I went to a fool's meeting and my president said, Hey, I'd like to come on your scrap. A, I had no idea he even knew what the scrap was, you know, so that was kind of cool. And I was like, really, you'd want to come on the scrap. And he did. And it was awesome. I got to interview him, talk about his philosophy on training. Uh, he was a huge fan of the, it's Court Smith uh, at OKC training. He was the fool's president at the time. And he'd read the talent code, which is Coyle's other book, which is an amazing book also. And uh, it was, I loved it. I loved it. And I, from that point on, I was wanting to interview people every week. And so that's where the scrap was born from. And that's where firehouse vigilance took off. And since then it's grown and grown and grown. So a lot of things played into that. I think COVID was a huge uh, benefit. Uh, I hate to say that, but COVID was a huge benefit to the weekly scrap because right when it launched COVID hit and everybody was stuck at home, including all the speakers who had usually a conference to be at every weekend. So the biggest names in the fire service, all of a sudden were free to come on the show. And, and it was like, okay, yeah, I'll come on your stupid show. I've never heard of. Why not? And that was awesome. And yeah. and everybody was, everybody was stuck at home with nothing better to do than watch a stupid show. They'd never heard of. And so I think that I was very beneficial for that. Um, I don't remember the question. So I'm just kind of rambling at this. So point. vigilantes, we're just talking Go about ahead. right. Your growth of, of firehouse vigilance to what it is now. Uh, I think the main growth it comes from, and I, I'm proud of this, and also very humbled. I be, I'm the luckiest dude in the fire service. You meet me any place, anywhere, and I will tell you I'm the luckiest person in the fire service to be some unknown dude from Oklahoma who gets to have the friends I get to call actual friends now that are scattered across this country. Some of the, from the most biggest names in the fire service to names you've never heard of, but the one thing they share in common is passion for this job, man. So I never want to downplay that. But I think the the probably the number one uh, reason for the success of the scrap is it's really, really consistent. It comes out every week. Uh, there's 200 episodes and it's been around almost four years. And 
I, I get the notification from Spotify at the end of the year, you know, because uh, it says, congratulations, you published 53 episodes this year. And I'm like, 53 episodes, 52 weeks? Pretty consistent. You know what I'm saying? So uh, I'm very, very proud of that. And I think that it's almost become like a old friend. If you know what it is, it's like, hey, the scrap. It's yeah. the scrap, you know. And so I think that's the one of the keys for the growth. Again, I can't take away from COVID because that played a huge part in it. And then, man, the guests are phenomenal. Yeah. Lamping last week, did you hear? That was that was powerful. I, I was listening to it today. Yeah. I don't go back and listen to a lot of scraps. And I, that one, man, I listened to that part about the, the, the Vegas shooting. Man, that was powerful. And then you throw in the audience, which you've got that going on right here. And they really are the key ingredient that drives this crap because they ask the questions that everybody wants the answers to. And you take a passionate firefighter who's at the top of his game. You take the firefighters asking the questions everybody wants the answers to. And you combine that and get me out of the way. Dude, it's 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 awesome. Lightning in a bottle, right? And, yeah. and then it seems like that grew in now into that vigilantes group where right. now, I mean, it seems like it, it started as a way for you know us to help you improve the script. Right. But now it seems like it's becoming it's a this, life of its own, right? It, it's very um, supportive. It's uh, educational. It grounds you because people go through the same struggles you go through, and it's such a small group. What is it? Only it's only like two or three hundred people, right? I think we just cracked three hundred people. Yeah. yeah, it's not it's not massive at all. And I don't know I don't know how that looks if it if it keeps you know what I'm saying, which is not a bad thing yeah. for me, but I don't know what it looks like for it. But it's it's been such a cool organic experience because it started as, hey, what do you guys think the next five questions should be, or who should be guests on the scrap? Do you guys want to have an influence on the direction of the scrap? And it's turned into this super supportive uh, place. You could come in, ask any sort of question. Um, the the whole V90 thing has been an unreal, amazing uh, experience, which is another, yeah, another accidental, um, really cool thing that was never meant to be shared. But because of the, I don't think I would have done it without the vigilantes. Yeah. It, does that make sense? I yeah. wouldn't have. And, and to see the reception of it. Um, no, the, it, like you said, it's this, it started out as one thing. And now I, I even asked the other day, it's like, I think it'd be really cool to put out like uh, the greatest bits. I said, it's like a play on words for greatest hits, but greatest bits of the scrap. And you yeah. take like Chief Ike and take like a 30 second segment of him ranting about insert whatever, and, you know, and take Cody Testrel and, and take all these, like take like 15 one minute bits or 30 second bits and turn them into a 10 minute YouTube montage. That'd be amazing. I oh, really do think it'd be cool. We run it through brick walls. If they put, put some music behind it, yeah. you know what I'm saying? It'd yeah. be awesome. But my problem is I, I just don't have the bandwidth to, to go through the, 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 the 300 or 400 hours of scraps that are out there. Yeah. 500, whatever the number actually is. Holy crap. It's couldn't, uh, and find them. Yeah. So I asked the vigilantes, Hey, can you pick your favorite moments that, when you're listening and timestamp them. And so they're they're finding the, the the moments and I'm getting ready to put out that first one. But that couldn't be possible without the vigilantes. Mm -hmm. You know, and sorry. <laughs> no, it, uh, seriously, and, and for those And like the are, vigilante bookmark. Yeah. Like yeah, you're responsible that, for you're responsible for the I, I don't I, have my book. My oh, book's I do. upstairs, but yeah. I do. Here we go right there. Yeah. You're responsible for the vigilante bookmark. Yeah, I It's mean, just it's cool stuff like that, man. Belonging, belonging. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, sorry it, for those of you that don't know too. Like it, it uh, we well, it's I've mentioned the form. One of the coolest things I've ever experienced as a firefighter, and I mean that truthfully, was was is that forum. Uh, it, the opportunity for all of us, and it, it ends up being about twenty, twenty five, maybe thirty people sometimes, uh, right? From all over the country, all get on a Zoom together, and we all talk about fire stuff. We all yeah. we have a topic. I mean, there's. It's an people raising their hands and it's, yeah. it's, it's <laughs> I wish there was a way to replicate that so everyone could experience it in the same way right because if you get that to be like 300 people it's not the same but I know that's what I that that is a concern of mine moving forward because yeah. it is getting it's getting because it started with like 20 people yeah and now we're at 300 and so I don't know what it looks like going forward so I really don't but it's interesting and it's been organic so we'll see yeah I mean I'm sure it'll it'll grow and change into whatever it is so uh but but I don't I don't know if you're like this magical moment we're in. It really is a cool part to be a part of, mm -hmm. and I don't know if that'll ever happen again. You know what I'm saying? That this the meetup at FDIC was really cool. Like that, that, yes, right? Like that's and so 
I've been trying to find a group, right, to be a part of in that way, and we're actually maybe considering starting a Fool's Chapter in our area. There's a couple ones that are near us, but they're not quite, you know, within there. a good range, so we're trying to maybe do something like that. But I think awesome. everybody searches for those kind of uh, groups and that, that culture of belonging. Uh, I'm going to rip over to some questions again. Here. Go, so, go. Um, I'm going to combine two together. So Andrew McGinn, Trevor Stein here, we're putting these two questions together. Who got you into reading? And then what are your top three books every firefighter should read? My mom probably is responsible for getting me into reading. Uh, I, she would take us to the library every week. Uh, on I, I don't know if it was a specific day of the week, but we would go check our books in and then check out more books. And originally I, I, I got into stuff like choose your own adventure books, you know what I'm saying? Like that's what got me hooked when I was like eight, nine or 10. Uh, and then I discovered the Hardy boys and I loved them. I mowed one summer all summer long so I could buy every Hardy boys out there. And then I got into the three investigators, which was, I think I'm, I'm going to guess I was about age 11 at this time. I need to go find those books, but they was all young adult mystery. They, these were some, some teenagers that went out and solved m mysteries. You know what I'm saying? It's just cheesy stuff like that. Uh, then I discovered fantasy books, which is like Tolkien, Lord of the Rings type, Game of Thrones type uh, fiction. And man, that that took off. That's where I really fell in love with reading was fiction and fantasy fiction specifically. Sword and sorcery. I'm a nerd when it comes to that stuff, 100%. Um, like, yeah, I'll grab This is the greatest author, Brandon Sanderson. If you haven't read him, this is book four of the... Uh, I forget even what it's called. The Stormlight Archives. Holy smokes. Greatest author uh, on the planet. I cannot wait for book five, which is coming out soon. So I'm a huge nerd when it comes to fantasy reading, 100%. Um, but so I love reading. Now, as I grew older, I was also super infatuated, utterly fascinated with human nature and why people do the things they do, human motivation. And so I discovered this whole realm of books that people wrote on psychology of human thinking and, and uh, organizational culture and why people do what they do. Uh, and that, and that, that was a whole nother uh, rabbit hole wormhole that I traveled down. As far as top three books, uh, I'm a huge fan of Victor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. Like 100% is one of my, the most impactful books I've ever read. Uh, I love, love, love that book. There is a space, man. Uh, 100%. I mean that with all my heart and soul. It doesn't matter what happens to you. Whatever stimulus comes at you, there's a stimulus, there's a space. And in that space, you get to choose your response, man. And it's powerful. So uh, man's search for meaning. Um, uh, I, I already referenced it. Stephen Covey's uh, seven habits, of highly effective people. That's the book that changed my life. I will never uh, not. I could probably reach, find a copy of it around my room somewhere here. Uh, and then, um, Leaders Eat Last by Simon Sinek is is if especially if you like the nerdy stuff about brain chemistry and why people do what they do, um, the dopamine, the serotonin, the oxytocin, and how human interaction actually forms chemical bonds in the brain, and it's like a uh, it's it's biochemistry. It's not like it's science on why certain things work in organizations uh, and why certain things utterly fail in organizations. Why you can you can actually uh, you know, David Rock scarf model and why you can actually push that uh, threat button and put people in a fight or flight mode, not, not, not seriously into actual code black, but like you can push them into a, a threat response of a raised heart rate. And uh, what's the bad cortisol cortisol yes, releases cortisol, into yeah. your bloodstream. Yeah. And you, it, it's all, it's like biochemistry and science. And once you start understanding this, you're like going, Oh, that's why when I did this, this happened. Yeah. You know, and then you can start doing if A, then B. And then when you start doing this and looking at the, the results, you can impact a culture. It's crazy. It's awesome. So those are the top three. I could keep going and going and going. Uh, it's your ship. Yep. Uh, Abershoff, man. Uh, I, I didn't realize this. I One thing I do is when I when I read a book, I'll show you. Because I'm reading this one huh, right here. The one I was talking about earlier. This book is a book I'm reading it's called yeah. I Love It Here. And it's not a bad book. It's not a bad book. But I, what I do is I put these little sticky tabs in it and I highlight the crap out of it. As I read it. anything I love, I highlight. And then what I do when I'm done reading the book is I go and I type up the book on my computer. I type up all the highlights, just the parts I liked. And then I type my own thoughts on the highlights, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And someone pointed this out to me because I typed the... <laughs> 
I type up the highlights in black and then underneath it, I change the font to red and I type up my thoughts. And I was showing one of my buddies this and he's like, so you're like the red letter. You, you think your words are like up there with Jesus's. And I was like, no, that, that's not the point. But if you have ever seen a red letter Bible, then you know what I'm talking about. But, uh, and anybody wants any of my notes, let me know. I have like 10 books done because I'm very, very slow on typing up my notes. I've been working on Robert Greene's Lousy Human Nature for literally a year. And I've got like 25 pages of notes on the book. And it's just, it's like taking me forever. But I went back and read my notes on It's Your Ship. And I didn't realize how much of it impacted my leadership uh, skill set. How much of it I put into the nine L's, you know, without subconsciously, not even realizing. It's an amazing book. Um, so anyway, that, sorry, I could, I could keep. Good. That was the start of my reading journey. So, so uh, two very different ends of the spectrum, right? I, I rejected reading. Uh, the only thing that I read regularly as a kid uh, aside from I, I was a big comic fan. I didn't buy a oh, lot of yeah. them, but my mom would take us to the grocery store and I would sit and, Heck I would yeah. read, and I and I loved reading and I and I still read a lot of comics uh, up until recently. I don't read as much anymore. But Calvin and Hobbes, that was Ooh. the other one. I read so much Calvin and Hobbes and I did not realize uh, to the point my, my wife bought me uh, for one of our anniversaries. I got a box of, of all of them. I, I didn't know the vocabulary that it gave me. I didn't know any of that stuff until later. But uh, I was not a reader at all. I remember when Harry Potter came out, my mom tried to get my brothers and I to read it, and we completely rejected that. And then I got to a point as, as an adult, and obviously it was heavily influenced from you and, and what you've been doing. I was like, I haven't read a book really most of my life. And It's Your Ship was the first one I did on audiobook, and that kicked it off. That moved then into uh, Pride and Ownership, which I'd only had little oh, yeah. bits and pieces of, right? But I never really actually like listened to Lasky all the way through. But the first true book I actually sat down and read, Legacy, which was about the um, all, all blacks, blacks. which yeah. was amazing, and that just yes. springboarded. And now, like I get it. Now I read books as books. I don't listen to audiobooks anymore. So if you're listening and you were like me and you weren't, you know, like Corley, who who's loved reading for so long, it's it's like a muscle. You just work it out, and eventually you get good at it. And, yep. and you, you start to comprehend things a lot better. The um, speed, the retention, and the comprehension comes, but you got to put it in the sets and reps. You got to read. You got to read. Hey, and, and, and I'll be very clear. I love Audible. I listen on almost every day. I have an Audible subscription, and I've got a book I'm listening to in some way, shape, or form because of my drive time. One of the beautiful things about Audible is you can do other things while you're listening. It's the strength of it. One of the downsides of Audible is that you can do other things while you're listening, uh, reading requires your focus. At best, you might be able to walk on a treadmill or walk around a track or something, but you can't do anything else that takes cognitive function while you're reading. And that is the strength of reading. It is it is deadlifts. It is squats for your mind. Okay, I won't rant on reading too no, much. No, yeah. Well, that was one of the topics we we're going to talk about anyway. Okay. I think it's really okay. important. I, I I will say, uh, for for me, reading readings actually. I don't, I don't think I was ever diagnosed with ADHD. I don't know. I probably do because almost every firefighter probably has it in some way. But um, it actually taught me to focus a lot better. I, I could not read if there was any noise whatsoever. But then I was sitting one day, and I'm more disciplined now, but I'm sitting looking at you know social media on my phone, and I don't hear anything else that's going on. I'm like, okay, so I can clearly have my brain programmed yeah, to tune yeah. everything out. Why can't I do it with books? And then it clicked, and I was able to kind of, I'm better with it now. Sure, you're more deliberate. Some no, stuff, I get it. But, no, I'm with you. No, that makes sense. Um, uh, Andrew McGinn and, and uh, Chris Dye, I'm going to get to your question here in a sec, but uh, I, I think we kind of talked about it and kind of answered it a little bit, but uh, saying that there is a difference between – audible and real books uh and that he knows that you do kind of say that regularly but uh, and yes. i think we talked about that right that you can get distracted if it's an audible but well and i will say and, I, and i'll get to I, I i like the question on the ipad or kindle or insert whatever electronic reader but uh audible is great for getting the content but audible and listening doesn't do the same cognitive exercise of forming the when you take a symbol and piece it together with other symbols and then make those symbols into a word and take those words and put them into a sentence and put those sentences together into a thought that you have to visualize, man, that creates all these neural pathways in your brain as you do that stuff. And you see a word that you don't recognize. And, and your brain tries to figure out from looking at the parts of that word and the letters that make up that word, what it is. There is so much going on. 
uh, when you're reading. And so in answer to the question, so Audible is great for the content. You can absolutely absorb the content. When you read, when you listen to It's Your Ship, you'll get the message that Avershaw is sending. You just don't get all the peripheral, uh, the the cognitive um, benefits of reading. So uh, I've never, uh, Andrew, in answer to your question, I've never thought about the difference between a physical book and a, and a Kindle or an iPad. I'm a huge fan of Kindles. I really am. I got one in front of me here. It's, that battery is, is very low. Um, uh, I do, I have a Kindle e-reader on my phone just so I can get my Kindle books. And when I don't have my Kindle with me, I can read them. I've never, I don't know. I love the physical feel of paper and I love being able to highlight and flip through. I, I can never find my notes on a Kindle, but that may be user error, but I can find my notes so fast with my tabs and my, my highlights. So uh, I, I don't, I think you get all the cognitive, uh, uh benefits of kindle and e-readers and I, uh, ipads i do i can't see a downside of that so it's tangible i guess that that's probably more right you're you're uh, making more than one connection instead of just ears now, now you're using your eyes your, your now if you have siri right? read it to you then you're just back in the audible <laughs> <laughs> uh huge pivot okay but i'm sure we'll get back to reading because yeah and uh uh chris Dye, He's, he's got a question here. Corley, best conditioning practices for your guys? So we're talking uh, common workouts and et cetera for your shift. Man, I'm a firm believer. It doesn't matter what you do. You do what works for you. So I go beyond. Uh, I don't try to enforce like everybody needs to do CrossFit and wall slams and, and burpees. You know, my my mantra is getting into the mindset of, of being prepared for whatever's coming. So if you can get to the mindset, then they're going to do what's best for them. So any workout, I don't want to say any workout's better than no workout. That's not what I mean. But when you can get people bought into the mission, when you can get them fire first focused, you, you can make them understand why it's important that they're fit. Then they're going to do on their own intrinsically. You know, I, I reference this quite a bit, which is uh, the, the movie, The Breakup with Vince Vaughn and Jennifer Aniston. And the, the, there's one of the most beautiful scenes in movie time history. It's, it's almost uncomfortable to watch. But she comes out of the kitchen and she's like, come on, we need to go clean the dishes. It's after the party is over. He's, he's playing Grand Theft Auto on the couch. And he's like, seriously, right now? And she's like, no, we need to go clean the kitchen. He's like, let's just do it in the morning. And she's like, no, let's do it now. You know I hate it. So he's like, fine. And he throws the controller down and he gets up. And at that point, she's like, never mind, never mind. And he's like, what? You wanted me to do the dishes. She goes, no, I wanted you to want to do the dishes. And, and he's like, why would anybody want to do the dishes? And it's such a beautiful, like it, it, it encapsulates intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. And so what you want is you want your people to want to work out. You don't want to make them work out. You don't want to tell them we're going to do, you know, kettlebell wall slams and, and this, you can absolutely do that. And, and sometimes that's your only option is is forced compliance i'm not knocking that but what's what is a thousand times more effective than forced compliance is getting your people bought into wanting to be fit and if you get that then you're so far ahead of the game they'll take care of the rest absolutely uh uh chris die he's talking he's trying to condition for georgia smoke diver so hell yeah gotcha. hell hey yeah. i would love to i would love to tell you like do this 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 and this uh i'm not a fitness guru by any stretch of the imagination i do a lot of weightlifting i do jujitsu I love both of them. I, mean, I wouldn't even say I'm good at them. Uh, like I'm a blue belt after like five years. So that tells you how bad I am at jujitsu. Uh, but I love it. And it's a great workout. Uh, if you are, uh, uh, Chris, there's, there was an episode on Fit to Fight Fire not too long ago. And they had Basil and uh, I can't remember the two other guys that were on there. But oh, the, just, all the, the ones that went from OF. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, that just did. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, uh, Georgia Smoke Diver. And uh, it's totally worth a listen. There's a lot of crazy things that I had never thought of that would go into the nutrition of that program and all that totally worth a listen to for sure. Uh, and I know Justin Frey is one of my favorite people, giant, uh, giant noggin, Justin Frey's. I mean that with all love, but Georgia smoke diver. And when my guys were going through Oklahoma smoke divers, uh, we had five guys come from Oklahoma, went to try out and two of them made it. Three of them are going back, to try again. Uh, long story short, he sent me a text that said, man, just focus on the next, Thing you got to get done don't focus on the end of the week if you if you if you if you look at the end of the week and how many burpees you got in front of you or how whatever the the rope hauls or hose drags or whatever you will give up 
but just focus on the next burpee and get it done. Just focus on the next thing and get past it. And and so that mindset right there, I'm not uh by like I said, I'm not a fitness guru. I struggle with my belly and uh trying to stay fit. And long story short is uh, but that's that's advice from someone that I I took that advice and I passed it on to our guys because I thought it was very solid. There you go, yeah. Absolutely solid advice for sure. How do you eat an elephant, right? One chunk at a time. That's it, baby. Same thing. Um, So, obviously, you've networked. We you'd mentioned before you've made a lot of really great friends throughout the course of this. And um, I'm trying to frame the question the right way in my own mind here. So, um, what advice would you give for someone who's maybe new to networking or doesn't? And doesn't realize the importance of it and is now trying to get into it. I think that that's something that nobody really is taught or understands, and uh, you're trying to make it up as you go along. So, how, what, what advice would you give to somebody who's trying to network and with other firefighters? I, I, I wish I would have understood the power of networking. Um, I wish I, I can't say that's enough. I wish I would have understood the power of networking. Uh, I'll give you, I remember it was 2018, roughly. And I was doing this research project to write my own article. I was working on this. I wanted to come up with the formula for there are this many BTUs being given off by a room and you need this many GPM or GPS, depending on how you want to look at it. And I wanted to come up with this formula that you could actually use, you know, to, to go BTUs versus GPMs versus, but again, I had to give up after a while. There's just too many factors, the size of the compartment, the fuel load, everything. There's, there's just no way you could ever turn it into something with my limited knowledge into something where, but I was working on it. And so I was doing a lot of research on the internet and uh, I found this article called apples to apples or apples to oranges. It was apples to apples. Uh, and it was Nick Ledeen again out of Eau Claire, Wisconsin. And, and I, and I saw this article and it was all about comparing GPM to GPS and, and actually comparing things that were equatable. And I don't remember the actual content of the, of the article. I'm sorry, Nick. Uh, but, I ended up, who is this Nick guy? And I love this article. I need to talk to this guy because he's on the track of what I'm after. And I ended up looking him up on Facebook, reaching out to him on Facebook and saying, can I call you? And he said, yeah. And we've been best friends ever since. Like straight up. Like I reached out to him for that reason. And he talked to me about his whole article. And and A, he's a brilliant firefighter. First of all, if you ever get a chance to take his and Dustin Martinez's class or just his class, the Grab Lab or uh, the Church of Search, uh, 100% 100% badass classes, but um, not the point. That was the, my first exposure to just reaching out blindly to someone that was a published author, someone who went around and spoke, and he was the most down to earth, badass dude that would just talk to me about. And 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 I've never had an experience. I w- I don't want to say never, but I, the the experience has repeated itself over and over and over. I don't care who it is, whether it's a Mike Champ or Ray McCormick who worked at FDNY, the the most badass truck dude and most badass uh, guy who wrote the engine company operation playbook for the FDNY. I don't care if it's uh, Mark Von Oppen from uh, the fully involved Mike Galliano. It doesn't matter. Insert whoever giant in the fire service, man, talk to them. They are humans and they, they are badasses. Uh, 100% douchebags don't rise to prominence as a general rule. Yeah. Uh, that was actually my goal uh, this year at FDIC. And uh, I, I met you, obviously, and then, you know, I made a point to go out of my way. And I won't tell my Bobby Halton story here, but uh, and maybe one day I can tell you it. But uh, I, I barely got an opportunity to meet him the, the year before he died. And after he died, I, I was like, OK, if I see any of these people, I'm just going to bulldoze my way right to them in a way, shake their hand and say hi and and to echo what you said, I, I've learned that that the people that get it, they will take all the time in the world to step aside, shake your hand, talk 100%. to you. Firefighters are firefighters, regardless of if they're on the biggest stage doing a keynote or if they're right there with you back home. And right. uh, and again, if you're listening, like like Corley is saying, reach out to those people. Uh, it's incredible. Like uh, this, by all accounts. I, would I have ever guessed that you would come on my show, you know? And, oh, bro. <laughs> and, and like, it's exciting and in, in, in a, no, another fact, you, world, right? In a non-fire service world, this probably wouldn't be the case, right? But because we're all firefighters, uh, and I'm sorry, I cut you off, but. It, no, 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 no. Uh, I, I, 
I, that humbles me because I'm like, I'm just this dude from Oklahoma, 100%. Like, I, I, I still expect someone to, to call me up and say, hey, dude, they're all just kidding. <laughs> they're like, this is a joke. Everybody's pulling a joke on you. No one watches your show. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I, like, I, that, this massive imposter syndrome, like someone's going to yank the carpet out at any moment. <laughs> I want to hear the Halton story, though. So I'll give kind of a short one. Uh, I'll, I'll try. So my last year was my first year doing FDIC's hot classes. I'd gone for the conference. I'd been able to do a lot of stuff in that way. But uh, I was fortunate enough my department, you know, f- funded me to be able to go and actually do the hot classes. And I, it must have been a time zone thing. I don't know. I'm a pretty punctual guy as an adult. I wasn't as a kid. And if my sure. dad's in here, he could probably echo that. But as an adult, I've become very punctual. And I take... A, a ton of pride in that, right, of being reliable. Like, I'm at work 45 to an hour early every single day. Like, that is what I strive to be. And um, I'm, I'm sleeping uh, with the guys who both had to uh, – that I went down there with. They both had um, – uh, they had the, this – not the high, hot. What's the other one? The workshops. They were in the right. workshops the, for those first two days. And, you know, I set my alarm. I thought I knew what time I was supposed to be there. Turns <laughs> out I was wrong. My phone starts buzzing. Hey, buses are loading up. We're leaving, and it was probably, I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes. Like, holy shit. We were staying in an Airbnb, like, outside of the main circle. Sure. I, my, I, I yelled at my friend, hey, I got to go. He's like, what? He's like, don't worry. Here, take my keys. Took off. Drove all the way. Made it. I, I get – and this was your first year there, right? So lay of the land here. I'm trying to put you in perspective. Yeah, so yeah. There's, there's a parking garage, and I wish I knew the street names, but – I'm at one end of the convention center coming up, right? And, and, it's, and it's a tiny convention center, so yeah. not a problem. Yeah, right. <laughs> super, super easy to get where you're going. So I get, to, I get to the corner, and there's all these people in vests and right with the clipboards and all that fun stuff. And uh, they're packing up. And I'm like, shit, I'm going to miss my classes. Like, I'm an idiot. Beat myself up. And I'm looking around for anyone that's going to help me. And I I don't know where. And I I don't know what the exact quote, but it was somewhere along the lines of, son, do you need some help? And I turn around, and it's Bobby Halton. Bobby Halton. And I'm like, uh, like, totally couldn't say a word. He goes, what class do you have? I was like, oh, I got this. And he's like, all right, well, luckily you're not late. But you got to go all the way to the other end of the convention center because your bus is the last one. You will make it. Go. I was like, oh, okay. So I drag all my bunker gear all the way down because I was doing hot classes. Fly all the way down there, make my bus, take a breath. I sit down and I go, well, Bobby Halton thinks that I'm notoriously late (laughs) and irresponsible and just some punk kid. So I was like, where I was saying before, I I didn't want – I I wanted to make sure that I controlled what my reputation was, right? So that didn't sit well with me. My dad would come later in the – now, like, later in his career. He would come later. He would only come from, sure. like, the Thursday on or something like that. And uh, he shows up, and usually I crash on the floor for free because that's FDIC. Really, that's what a lot of people do. So Absolutely. The guys from my group were going to leave, and he came down. So him and I were walking the show floor, and uh, we were talking. We were over by, like, the book area, right, uh, where the, the fire engineering bookstore. Yeah. And – I go, hey, stop, I'll be right back. And I turn, and Bobby's walking, and I run up to him, and I'm like, hey, Chief, uh, happy to see you. I don't know if you remember me. Uh, but And he goes, yeah, did you make your bus on time? Floored. Like, That's amazing, oh, my dude. God. And, uh, and I'm like, yeah, I did, sir. He goes, are you having a great time here? I was like, absolutely. He goes, did you get somewhere along the lines of, like, did you learn something, right? He was very into making sure that you were having a good experience. Told him yes, walked back. I'm pretty sure, hey, Dad, if you're in here, <laughs> I'm pretty sure you were teary-eyed. And that's okay. <laughs> but he goes, that was a pretty big moment. Like I, he's, and it was for me, obviously. And uh, it was just really cool to see how down to earth he was. And no, hundred percent. The only interaction I ever had with him, one to one, right? And totally blew my my mind. And uh, from th- from then, that experience made me realize, like, reaching out to people that you're, you know, that you look up to in the fire service is not a weird thing. And you should do it. And you should take every opportunity you can to reach out to people. And, and they'll probably, they'll answer you, right? No, 100%. If I think good, I, they'll answer. 100%. And I will say this. Always be respectful of their time, especially in like that setting and stuff like that. Don't don't try to dominate because they're, they are nice people. They'll sit there. and But at, there's a point where you need to back off and give them, give them their space too. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. 
Yeah. I had that. No, one hundred percent. I had that with Ike this year. I walked up. I was like, "Hey, Chief." He's like, "Hey, nice to meet you. I gotta go." I was like, "No problem. See you." Like that was it. Yeah. You know, you yeah. gotta be able to get in and out. Yeah, totally. No, one hundred percent. Because because uh, yeah, that, and I'm not saying it like don't do it. Do it absolutely. Because there's times when they have nothing going on and uh, we'll, can talk to you for ten or fifteen minutes. But there's also times when they are have to be somewhere. Yeah. So it, it, yeah, it is what it is. I don't know but, that side of the show with you guys, but yeah. It's awesome. No, no, uh, the the American Fire Service, like I said, man, by and large, the people who are well-known and made it and huge and whatever term you want to put on it are down-to-earth, badass firemen that uh, that's all they are, and, and they love talking firemen, and especially outside of, like, time constraints. You catch them at, at the bar with a beer, and they'll sit there and swap stories with you and, and have a blast and talk to you. It's It's amazing, man. Yeah. I think I ripped by Ramagus on a scooter, <laughs> one of those rental Uber scooters, and I, I hammered right. on the brakes, and I was like, nope, Alex, <laughs> you know what you're supposed to do. Turned around, shook his hand. Uncle Ray was there, shook his hand, then took off and went on with whatever. I think I was on the way to the vigilantes thing, actually. No, I think I right on. Right I was on. like, hey, you going to Corley's thing? He's like, no, we got dinner. I was like, ah, whatever. <laughs> we got important stuff to do. Yeah, I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love it, man. I love it. Like I said, I'm blessed. I'm so lucky, dude. The, the, I get to be on your podcast. How how, how awesome is that? Nah. I mean, I'm being very serious. I'm like, it's crazy to me. Nah, it's cool. It's it's really cool to see how how connected we all can be like that. Instantly, we can be connected if we want to. Uh, so one of the things that I also kind of learned here, again, with that Vigilantes meetup that I want to talk about because I think it's super important – is uh, the involvement of, of having your family sharing your mission. So from what I've gathered, and, I could, and I'm ignorant to it for the most part, but it seems like Amanda's with you for a lot of the stuff, a majority of the things, right? Your wife is with you for a majority of the things. Uh, how did that come up, and then you know, how has that helped you grow, and, and what's your dynamic with firehouse vigilance but balancing with your wife? I'm a very lucky person. Again, I, I, you, that's a mantra you're going to hear from me over and over and over. I'm a blessed person, man. I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Uh, but part of it is I, me and Amanda got together very young. I was 19. She was 17. Um, we had kids very young. And so I had three kids by the time I was 22 years old. And uh, now here I am. I'm 47 years old. All my kids are adults. My oldest is 26. My boy is my baby. He's 22, about to be 23, two years on the fire department. So, And we have no grandkids. So this, this, it's this window of, I'm still relatively young. My kids are all adults and, and high functioning adults who don't need supervision in any way, shape or form. And I have no grandkids. So I'm not missing little league games, uh, dance recitals, first steps, or, or people saying Papa. Uh, and, and we're also, me and Amanda kind of hit this point where we're empty nesters, you know, at the same time, firehouse vigilance came into to being. So I know a lot of a lot of couples, especially our whole life was kind of centered around our kids, you know, fire service, kids, career, you know, that's life. That's everybody's life. Um, but right about the time our kids made us empty nesters, a lot of couples struggled to say, well, our kids are gone. How are we going to connect? What, what, what do we got now? We've been focused on them for 20 years. What do we do? And I think, and I, 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 I don't think I've ever put this into words before now. But I think that uh, firehouse vigilance and the traveling and the and and her becoming involved kind of became our thing that, that united us as we figured out what the next phase looks like. Now we both readily acknowledge as soon as the grandkids show up, we don't know what that looks like because we're going to be eight up with the grandkids, like like a hundred percent. I I don't. I'm not going to be traveling every four day, and. I'm not, I don't need to shoot. The scrap may get put on the shelf and go away when the grandkids get, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, Cause we are very, very, very kid slash grandkids slash family oriented, but I don't think that'll happen, but uh, it's going to be a, we don't know what it looks like, but in answer to your question, I think that uh, the firehouse vigilance actually became that thing that where most couples struggled to connect. We just kind of naturally fell into it. And it's been very cool because, uh, like she's been asked to speak and stuff. And, and, and the crazy part is she's a really good speaker. Like she's a better speaker than me. And it's kind of cool. But uh, I'm, I'm like very unnatural speaker. And like my heart rate on my Fitbit will try <laughs> skyrocket to like 160. And uh, before I speak, but I love, I, I love doing it. Don't get me wrong, but it's, it's unnatural to me. So uh, in answer to your question, I think that the dynamic and her being able to support me so well is because, for 20 years, 26 years, her life has been her kids. And sometimes to the detriment of our relationship. And, and that's something we talk about. Uh, 
and all of a sudden that that wasn't needed no more and she needed something to put her attention into and, and firehouse vigilance was it and she is she is the most amazing uh person on the planet if anybody follows firehouse vigilance there is no better hype person to have on your side than amanda Moore. period like she's amazing so anyway uh like i said i'm blessed and lucky like like the timing of it to fall into place like it did because if our kids were younger it would not have played out this way yeah you know I mean... if, if if the grandkids would be here it would not have played out this way <laughs> right like you know my, this is this is my life back yeah. here right? like it's <laughs> And and that's why I do it late is because like I know the kids are at least asleep right and and but if we didn't have like the ability to do virtual stuff like this I there's no way I could do it like right travel right to meet people. like you like, said earlier before we went live which I'm not trying to give any behind the scenes info be like nah. hope my hope my kids stay asleep yeah. well, but, but that's life that's I life know, man yeah, we just put my oldest into a, into a into a big kid bed for the first big time kid tonight. bed yeah and it's like oh gosh hopefully it works which it has so far but. You know, we'll I say we just we jinxed it. We probably did, but it's like Dada, what's up? Uh, yeah, hopefully. Well, a- Emily's upstairs, or maybe Fair she's enough. in bed already. Hopefully, <laughs> but no, it's awesome. And, and like I said, man, if if it's just the timing really worked out, where I'm the luckiest person on the planet, where I could just go, I could go full bore into this and not miss anything in in family life. Yeah. Because one thing I preach, I preach it over and over and over. Hey, I love mental health, man. I'm a huge advocate for we have to look out for each other. I won't I won't go into a huge rant, but I will say this. People to preach work life balance. You know, how do you balance firefighting and, and family? There is no work life balance, period. Your family comes first all the time, every time. If you lose sight of that, this job will eat it up. It will replace it. You will end up divorced and lonely. Uh, keep your family first, period. So there is no work-life balance. Hundred uh, percent. Oh, I just stole one of your lines, but <laughs> yes. Uh, I wish I could claim it, but I, I say it a lot. Don't get me wrong, okay. but it's not mine. That was one of Amanda's <laughs> jokes at the meetup too. She she goes, we both say it all the time. Hundred percent, <laughs> brother. We do. I, honestly, I don't even notice it when I say it. Like I, I really wasn't even trying to say it as a joke there. <laughs> it's okay. It's a tick. Well, was she? A, she was a stay-at-home mom, right? Uh, well, she's always worked in some way, shape, or form. Okay, whether, sorry. It was, whether whether it was no, 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 hundred percent. She was hundred percent a stay at home mom. It's one of the reasons my kids are so great. I firmly believe that she put a ton of time into them. Uh, but she also would clean houses. You know, when when as soon as they could go to school or anything like that, uh, she got a realtor's license so she could work. Uh, she's held down various jobs. Uh, absolutely, she's always been working in some way, shape, or form. But her kids have always come first. Yeah, uh, that's a yeah short answer. It's a, it's, a, man, it's a benefit. That's what we're living right now. I think she would classify herself as a stay at home mom, although that that's a misnomer because she worked the entire time. OK, you know what I'm saying? And so it's like almost like a I, I don't think there's a tougher job than stay at home mom as far as like like I tell people this all the time. And people look at me funny when I first start to say, it, especially women uh, or, or say, I shouldn't say just women, but just moms and, and wives in general or, or housekeepers, I should say uh, the people who tend to the home. Yeah. I say. Laundry is easy. Like laundry is, it, it really is easy. All right. But, th- and this, I, this is the part where I have to qualify. It just never ends. It never fucking ends. No. Right. And so that's the part. It's just, a, it's, it's, it's this, it's, it's a special kind of grind. Like doing a load of laundry is nothing, but it's putting it, it away. never <laughs> ends. It never ends. And so that's the part you have to wrap your mind or, or, or just accept, you know, because it is easy to fall into that. Hey, I just, I just, probably two teenagers out of a car and they're never, they're, they're going to be drinking through straws the rest of their life or, or they're, they're dead. You know, what are you complaining about laundry for? But yeah, but it but, never goes away. That's it. But, <laughs> Injury. Just, yeah. yeah. There's different, but it's different stresses. It's different things, right? Like right. you, you shield probably uh, your significant other from that stuff. My, my V90, my first two goals were do my laundry and help Emily with her laundry. So hell yes. Like, <laughs> Dude, <laughs> that was, like that's our house. That's a joke. We're we're both pretty good about a lot of things, but man, that one. I'm telling you, Amanda's oh. Amanda's love language is acts of service, yeah. and I wish I was better. I wish I could say I was better. I'm not. But man, when I make a load of when I, when I go in there and I like throw the washer over to the dryer, kick it off, throw a fabric softener in it, and start another load, dude, that's that's sweet, sweet <laughs> love talking, man. Uh, but I, I, I don't I do feel it. Emily is the same way. Yeah. Uh, the, the dishes, but, the laundry, the, yeah. the little things. Yeah. When I come home from work and, and, and I like 
oh, look, there's a lot of dishes in the sink. I'm going to go ahead and load the dishwasher. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. That she'll notice that instantly. Instantly. So, anyway. Uh, now, Kyle Condo. Yeah. What'd you say? Sorry, I'm, read, I'm reading comments. Oh. Kyle Condo. V90, represent. Yeah, right? Re- represent, for sure. Oh, that's awesome. Um, On the subject of family again and being multi-generational, okay. you did a uh, – I, I did see on your, on your Facebook page that you and your son – went to FDNY for that medal yes. ceremony. Yes. Uh, talk about that for a little bit. What was that experience like? And especially with your son. Oh, brother. That's the part that uh, – it was. It would have been a cool thing no matter what, right? Like it would have been a cool experience no matter what. But being able to go with my son, whoo, buddy. Uh, again, I already said he's my hero. But, hey, uh, I met Frank Lee last year. I don't know which one. H-Rock, Water on the Fire, one of them. And uh, – we hit it off. And, and, and this is something I'll say about Frank Lee, but uh, everybody hits it off with him because he's an amazing human being. So if you meet him and talk to him, he's an amazing human being. Uh, so long story short, uh, we became friends, like tight friends. And we every time we see, but he invited us up to Metal Day. It was also, Amanda couldn't go because she had a, an engagement in Missouri. And so we were like, well, we can't really make it. And then through, through talking it out with Amanda, and other, it's like, Frank Lieb invited us to Metal Day. Me and my son can go to Metal Day. <laughs> yeah, it's a no-brainer. So we ended up flying up on Tuesday, going to Metal Day on Wednesday, and flying home on Thursday. It was just like that quick of a trip. But I'm telling you, sitting and, – and my boy's on the job, and I called Frank, and I said, hey, uh, what are we supposed to wear to this thing? He's like – I'll do my Frank Lee voice. You're a firefighter, ain't you? I'm like, yeah. He's like, well, then, then wear your class A. And I was like, all right. He goes, I said, what's my son supposed to wear? He's like, he's a firefighter, right? And I was like, yeah. He's like, tell him to wear his class A. And I'm like, oh, man, he's he's pretty new on the job. He hasn't bought a class. Because they have time to buy their class A, you know, with their uniform allowance and stuff. And uh, he's like, well, that's – he." I said, he don't have a class A yet. He, I thought you said he's a firefighter. And uh, – he was busting shoes or breaking shoes. That's what he says, breaking shoes. And um, he said, well, he can, it's whatever. There'll be lots of people there in t-shirts. He's it's fine. It's fine. And so I told my son that. And like that next, we, we were leaving on Tuesday. Monday, he went to the uniform shop and they rushed and he got his class A done. So we showed up, class A, his hat, everything. Uh, we showed up. Joe Driver picked us up at the airport or at the hotel, took us to metal day. Hung out with Frankly, went to the collations in the Queens, went to the ones in the uh, uh, the Bronx, and I mean, just just the people that were there, yeah. just the connections, the 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 sheer number of firefighters in Class A's in various states of undress, like not not like undress, but like open collars, you know, ties loosened, people in in Class B's, uh, drinking beers raising toast, celebrating each other. And this is the thing is they celebrate tons of rescues. They, I think they gave away 68 medals that day. I don't quote me on the number, but an amazing number of medals. And then, and one of the jokes is they call it, uh, I say jokes. One of the running themes is it's called truck appreciation day. Cause a lot of truckies win medals because they make the grabs. Right. And, but the, this, this underlying theme throughout the whole thing is, yeah, you may have won the medal, but it's because of your crew. You know, they don't say it, but it's all there. It's, 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 it's this, uh, and it was, it was, it was a cool experience when we're at the collation, like, uh, the FD and wise pipes and drums, they travel around to each one, each of the boroughs and they travel by boat. And then they come marching in with the drums. I actually had my phone out recording it, you know, when they coming in and I'm like, Oh, this is sweet. I'm catching the whole thing. And I look and I'm not recording. I'm just holding my, I'm just holding my phone up. This is so angry. So I kind of like the telling of, but they do the ring of honor. And then the, the medal winners get to go down into the ring of honor. And then the medal winners get to invite their family into the ring of honor. All the while the pipes and drums are playing. And then the crews rush in and they pick the medal winner up on their shoulder. Because it's all about like, yeah, the truckies win the medals, but they can't do it unless the engines put the fire out. Yeah, you won the medal, but you can't do it without your crew. And it's this underlying, just this esprit de corps, this camaraderie, this, this, you can't, the whole time I'm there, I'm thinking, how do we, how do I take this back home and encapsulate any of this back at my department, you know? Uh, so, and combine that all with, I'm there with Frank Lieb and his son. Kurt Isaacson is there with Trevor, his son. 
and I'm there with my son, all enjoying this and taking this all in together. So, uh, like I said, when I tell people I'm the luckiest person in the fire service, it's not hyperbole. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, that's an incredible it's, experience. No, it's unreal. I, it's, it, I try to explain it and I know, I know firefighters get it, yeah. but if you're, if you're anyway, yeah. Do you guys, do you so, guys have an honor guard? Do you have any of that? In, in your we family? have an honor guard at more. Uh, it's, it's, and, and not knock it. It's just the, it's, it's ebbs and flows. You know, some yeah. people are really into it, become part of it. Then they lose or they have kids, you know, at first they're into it then they have kids or life comes along and then they're not as into it and it ebbs and flows. Yeah. Do you guys have a, uh, does, uh, well, I don't know <clears throat> how to say the IFF for you guys. We're AFFI. And we no, have, we're IFFI. Well, yeah, but what's your state version of IFF? Do you oh, have, uh, OSFA, OSFA, Oklahoma State. Yeah. So, uh, we have an AFFI honor guard that uh that i'm part of and oh okay uh, state state like almost like a yeah yeah so the state when there's a firefighter fatality they deploy us and we okay we go anywhere I, i've only been on for a couple years but um if we have anything experience. like that i am unaware of it okay. if we have something like that. like i know our crew our, our people have been called out for some uh funerals and things like that and we've been a part of other plugging in and becoming part and and I, our honor guard is very good. They practice and everything. But it's just a <clears throat> we're not a huge department. So when your when your pool is smaller, yeah. it only takes it only takes a couple people falling out, and all of a sudden you're like down to a, a very few people. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Oh yeah. I, I, ours is. I didn't. I didn't know what I was getting into. I uh, a couple guys. So ironically, when I got my first class A's, it had honor guard sewn above my, and I was like, oh, I'm not on the honor guard. And they're like, ah, oh, it was a it was a misprint or something like that. You well, are now, sir. <laughs> do you want to be on the honor guard? And I was like, uh, okay, sure. Like, uh, nerd alert. I was in marching band at school. Like, I, I right was, I, right? And like, yeah, that stuff made sense to me in a way, the, the posture and all that crap. But I, I like, yeah, I'll join the honor guard. Sure. And right. they go, all right, well, you're going to go to, you know, this town and uh, for the weekend and you're going to learn how to be on the honor guard. I'm like, okay, show up. And it's a full blown ceremony that I was supposed to bring my family to. I thought I was going to a training and this, this big, like the AFFI honor guard is huge. I mean, it's, wow. it's powerful. If, if you ever get a chance to see it's so organized, it's so, um, you talk about a spirit of court. I mean, it's the, the history and, and I'm <coughs> just scratching the surface and I'm so new where I don't have a lot of that stuff beat up in here, but, right um, on. uh, it's incredible. But yeah, our, our, um, the AFFI's president basically deploys us if we get anywhere in the state, if there's a firefighter fatality or if they need us for something. Any um, sort of ceremony. And, That's awesome. And we, we all go. Whoever can make it can go, right? Obviously not everybody can make it. Anytime, and I think, but... uh, again, uh, it all comes down to leadership. The the One of the people that was the driving force behind Moore's Honor Guard, which was a very elite Honor Guard at one point, they kind of promoted and moved out of that position. And then so – everything rises and falls on leadership. That's the way it is. And, and, and so it's not as strong and prominent as it used to be. Yeah. It's, well, I think that's a fair statement without being derogatory. Sure. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And it, it's hard to, to find yeah. the next, the next group. Right. And especially something like honor guard. Like, again, I didn't know what I was even getting into. And then I showed up and I was like, <laughs> Holy shit, this is, this is way more than I, than I realized that I was, I was signing up for uh, right. That, hey, you just put the wrong thing on my arm. Yeah, I right. All, all of a sudden, I'm <laughs> okay. I'm here. Like I'm up that's awesome, though. Right? Hey, that, like, that's a really cool story for how to get involved in it. Man. <laughs> just randomly, <laughs> right? That's awesome, man. Uh, I'm ah. gonna, going through some of these comments here. So, uh, uh, get your son to hold the phone next time. That's going back to to Metal Day. <laughs> yeah, if, if that would have been a better. Hey, I'm, I'm pretty sure he's probably told me that. I'm not gonna lie. He he loves to let me know. Uh, yeah, absolutely he loves to break my shoes. Yeah, uh, uh, Timothy Wood. We did see the two firefighters in New Jersey. We uh, yeah, we we acknowledged them earlier as best. Well, as, yeah, I don't know how to acknowledge them. I'm terrible at that. Other than just saying, you know, yeah, it's just terrible, man. Terrible, right? Uh, yeah. Uh. So last call, I guess in a way, for questions. So if you guys have anything else for Coralie, throw it in there. But I'm going to kind of roll into some of these uh, these more closing questions. Um, so have you ever lost your passion for the fire service? And and if you have, what? how would you get it back? And what keeps you passionate about the fire service? 
have I ever lost? I don't think I've ever lost my passion for the fire. I, I'm, I'm just, I'm a passionate person. Like for whatever reason, I'm kind of broken. I don't, I don't have a better way of saying it. I don't know if that's even the right way to say it. I'm just passionate. I really am. Whether it be uh, my book writing, my reading, I'm, I'm very passionate. So I've never lost my passion for it. Now, have I lost my connection to the calling? Absolutely. Uh, in fact, I didn't have a connection to the calling for my first 10, 15 years. Um, I really didn't. And I was, I love being a firefighter. I've always loved fighting fires. It's one of the coolest things in the world. I love kicking in doors, saving babies that like everything about being a firefighter, everything about our legacy, everything about the shoulders of the giants of the people that we stand on and have done so much more that I will never hold a candle to, man. I love being a part of that, belonging to that and carrying it on. And, and undeservedly wearing that mantle, man, I've always loved that. So now, um, I haven't always been connected to, look, the secret to this is staying connected to, this is real. Like 30 years for 30 seconds, that whole article I referenced earlier with Nick Ledeen, man, this is the real deal. Are you going to be just another person who's not, and that's like, are you just going to be, or are you going to go out there, put in the sets and reps, master the basics, week in, week out, keep studying for the test, even though the test will never or may never come. And so that's it, man. That's the mantra I preach. So yes, I've absolutely lost my connection. I've always been passionate, uh, but I've absolutely lost my connection. Um, now, over the last five years, I what keeps me passionate is, I, 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 said, I, I alluded to it earlier or talked about it earlier, I get to go two, three times a month, travel to a different state in the country and meet firefighters who face the same problems I face in my department, who face uh, struggles and they are plugged in, they are dialed in. I, I get to interact week in and week out with the top 2% of, and that might be generous, but the top 2% of the American Fire Service. And that keeps me fired up. When when I, I could pull up my phone, open it up and say, Chief, I'm a 32 year guy. I listened to, I found the weekly scrap and oh, I didn't know how much of the fire service I was missing. And it, that part to me is like, holy crap, you know, thank you for a taking the time to tell me that, but B, how do you even like say, I, I, yeah, that's what keeps me fired up. I, I, and one of my main things I send back to people is I type it down and say, thank you for sharing this with me. That's what keeps me fired up. And I send that over and over because it does. It really, really does. Like it blows my mind that people say, uh, <laughs> and I, I mean this in the greatest way, my dumb conversations like, like this one. And I don't mean that in a derogatory way. I hope you understand. But my dumb conversations with my friends where I let my other friends come in and ask the questions and I just kind of sit there like an idiot. But those things impact people in such a massive way. And that's a huge, humil uh, not humiliating, humbling, humbling, not humiliating, humbling experience that I'm so, so proud of. So I'm humbled by it and so proud of it. And you smash those together and that's what you get is this. What do you think so, uh, a young firefighter maybe that doesn't have necessarily the access to like those kinds of resources or, or, or a lot of the things that you are lucky and beneficial to have, what can they do to kind of replicate that, that opportunity of networking in the same way? What can they do? I think this is the greatest time to be alive and be a member of the American Fire Service. Now, there, now maybe you could argue the war years and, and it, or, or Jobtown, you know what I'm saying? But, but if, if you love fires, the way I love going to fires. But I think that the fact that there's no excuse for not – there's scraps, there's outliers, there's all these just unbelievable resources that are at the – literally arms, arms length away. There is no excuse for not being plugged in. If you are, if you don't know what's going on, if you're not plugged into the data, if you're not plugged into the tactics and the research, like you can go download a summary of NFPA 1700, which is one of the best NFPA documents ever made, and read the considerations, the safety considerations, tactical considerations on anything that might be in your jurisdiction. And man, it's just, and I'm not even a huge NFPA fan. If you listen to the scrap, you know this, but 1700 is amazing. It really, it's the best one written. Uh, I, I shouldn't say best one because I haven't read them all, but it's a phenomenal document and, but there's no excuse and, and, and throw NFPA out the window. Just start talking about the, the weekly scrap, national fire radio outlier podcast. There's so much available that if you're ignorant, you almost have to be willful to be ignorant and it's a great time to be alive. So that's what I would say to anybody young is 
No one has to give you permission to be awesome. No one. If you're waiting on someone to grant to come and to come and knight you and say, go be awesome, man, you're waiting on the wrong thing. Go out there, learn, focus on your sphere of influence and become a badass. Awesome. Yeah, 100%. Uh, if you were to give someone or if you wanted to give someone a sense of uh, how fire service culture should work by meeting one person, who would it be? Alive or dead? Oh, wow. Dude, that's tough, man. I, I, that was tough when I, you know, man, that's tough. Alive or dead, who would it be? I don't want to dodge the question. I really don't. But, man, that's, that is that is rough. Because, like, I instantly want to talk about the person that had a huge impact on me, which is Mark Von Oppen and, and the Big Four. Do your job, treat people right, all in attitude, all, all in effort. Um, I, I instantly go to him. Rick Lasky, Pride and Ownership, that book is the reason I made retirement videos for like, uh, I don't want to, I want to say I made like 27 retirement videos. And if you get the chance to see them, they're pretty freaking amazing retirement videos because we were the people in that book who just said, here's a cake, see you later, you know, and we completely changed the code because of Rick Lasky's impact. Um, David Rhodes in his keynote speech this year, unapologetic, like, holy smokes, that was a sledgehammer that the American fire service needed. Like, uh, yeah. God bless that man. Um, so I'm not trying to dodge the question. It's just I, there's so many that impact me, and I'm leaving so many out right now. Um, like I've, I've referenced Nick Ledeen. I don't know how many times tonight. Uh, Kurt Isaacson. Good Lord, that man's influence on my life, on the scrap. He's coming up on 200 because he is that big of an influence. Um, so I'm not trying to dodge the question. It's just I don't think I could wrap my arms around the answers to – how many people have impacted me and how many people I think people should be exposed to. Like, okay. I, I'm not, I hate dodging the question. You're not dodging it. It's okay. 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 <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Shoot. Brian brush. Holy crap. Yeah. yeah Brian. He's in, I was just he's in my backyard. He's in my backyard. Brian crush. Uh, <laughs> yes. That's what I'm saying. I'm, I, I hesitate to even mention names because after 200 episodes, there are literally so many people that have, uh, and and that's just a slice. That's like, like that's not. If you took a slice of how many badasses are in the American Fire Service, those two hundred that I've is is not even. They're just representative of how many awesome, unbelievable people are out there. So, uh, final answer, yes. I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of think I know maybe a little bit of the answer to this, but maybe I'd be surprised. So. Uh, Right now, triage, the current state of the American Fire Service. So green, mm. we're talking it's going strong. Yellow, it's injured. Red, it's dying. Black, it's dead. No, I like this. I love this question when you asked it earlier because it really made me think. I was like, what am I? What would I say? What would I say? And I, and my answer is red. I, I, I focused on that pretty quick. I really do think it's in the red. But this is the cool part of the answer is that I think it's red, but it's to the trauma center and it's stabilizing you know what I'm saying? Like we've, we've, we've triaged it. We've analyzed it. We've got it to the trauma center and we're, we're slowly stopping the bleeding. We're getting the systemic problems fixed. Uh, I'll rant for just a minute here and, and explain why I, I believe this. And I've done it. People who've heard me talk know that this is one of my uh, firm beliefs, but everybody asks, what's the problem? Why are we having so many retention and recruitment issues? Right. And that's a very multifaceted question. There's no simple answer to it, but I have my version of why I think we're at where we're at. Cause this is the greatest job on earth, period. It's the greatest job on earth. I believe that with all my heart and soul, I can argue with anybody about why that's the case. Uh, you may not ever become rich doing it. Um, but it is the greatest job on earth. We get to hang out in a, I, I, I hate to use the term like locker room or fraternal organization because that, that almost excludes females and that's not the point of what i mean but at the brotherhood the sisterhood we get to hang out in a house and eat great food work out laugh our asses off play pranks on each other and then when the bells drop we get to go make a difference in people's lives on their worst day and that is the that look, this is the greatest job on earth and nothing will ever change that aspect of it now what I will say is this, is this has always been the greatest job on earth. And if you go back and I, and I put my finger and if you let me rant for just a minute, I'll, 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 I, won't, I promise not to go too long, but about the 1940s, 1950s, um, 
it's the greatest job on earth. Norman Rockwell, firehouses, kids coming up, playing on the fire truck, spraying the water hose, you know, all that kind of stuff. And uh, just just nostalgic America, Americana. And the problem with the American Fire Service is that the greatest job to have is a company officer. You get to be heavily influential on your direct span of control. So the five, four, five, six people you're responsible for are directly in your span of control. And you spend 24, 48 hours at a time with them and you laugh your ass off and, and, and eat and, and yeah, everything together. And then when the tones drop, you get to go rely on each other in, in life altering situations. And there is no bonding like that in anything that I know other than maybe military combat, which I've never been a part of. So I have to qualify. And uh, so with that being said, if company officers, the greatest job in the greatest job on earth, it's baked into the cake that what happens and it started happening. I put the, I put my finger in the 1950s, forties is company officers stopped promoting firefighters that love the job stopped promoting. So starting then who promoted, who, who promoted is politicians, rule makers, bean counters, whatever term you want to put on them, but they weren't firefighters because the firefighters stayed in the company officer position, which is no big deal at first. And then, you know, he had fires in the war years in the sixties and the seventies, but you extrapolate this over 80 years. And then you get things like all hazards approach. You get things like a focus on EMS. You get things like a focus on, we have to justify our existence instead of fighting fire. You get a you get a safety culture first instead of a them first instead of the citizens come first. You, if you extrapolate this over time, you get to where we're at. And so people ask me why is recruiting and retention so far down? It's because firefighters quit promoting seventy years ago. So if firefighters don't promote, who does? Rule makers, policy makers, bean counters, and they make rules that don't make sense to firefighters. I don't know how many organizations I've been in. I'm like, why would they do this? I don't understand. Well, it's because they're not a firefighter. They promoted because firefighters don't promote. So the problem in the American Fire Service, and the reason it's in the red, is because for 70 years, firefighters have quit promoting and taking positions of authority. And, right, it's because the job sucks. I'll be honest with you. Like, and, and, and there are exceptions. Do not get me wrong. There's a lot of good battalion chiefs out there that promote up a lot, a lot. And there's a few district chiefs, a few, and then there's even less, like a handful of fire chiefs that are firefighters. And and I'm, I'm speaking with hyperbole, of course, and a little exaggeration. But uh, just looking at the scrap, I think I've had five fire chiefs on the scrap out of 200 episodes. And I think out of all five of those, I think all five are fools members. It's a very, very rare thing for a fire chief to be a fools member. And so anyway... Uh, I know I'm going in a, in a long rant, but we got firefighters have to promote. They have to promote so they can make policies that make sense to firefighters. So we can quit making safety first decisions. So we can quit making policy driven decisions. So we can quit trying to turn a job that requires a thinking firefighter to make a decision in an emergent situation where lives hang in the balance based on a checklist instead of off of the, what they know and their experiential and their training and their preparation. Um, <sighs> okay, I'll quit. No, <laughs> sorry. I, you got me fired up. I'm right there with you. I, I totally agree. <laughs> uh, I think. I think. Right, were we talking about it on this, or was it the green room before? I don't remember. But like, uh, yeah, it's it's a huge issue where you get a point where you don't have firefighters in in, in the offices anymore. And <sighs> and I think it was at the vigilante meetup. I said. I said. I was talking. I was doing my normal rant, and I said, and it took us seventy years to get here. It's going to take us 70 years to get out of it. And someone like said, hey, I don't think so. They said social media and, and the internet and the, the world, has, the, the fire service world especially has shrunk down. It's not going to take near as long to get out of it as it took to get into it. And that is a ray of hope. Yeah, the, I, the loudest, that's what when I took away from, from Chief Rhodes' uh, uh, speech was, was the loudest voice is not the recliner snipers, the mouches, right. right? It's not those guys anymore, the mutts. It's not them. Like, it's it's us. It like he said, it's it's his. You're part of my tribe now, is what he said, right? Yes. It's that tribe. We're in that tribe. Most of the people, all the people probably listening, are in that tribe. 
we have the power. We're the loudest voices now. When when the editor in chief of Fire Engineering gets up there and says that he's for you know a fire first culture that is about getting in and rescuing victims, putting fires out from interior, you have all the ammo you need to be able to yes. go back to your firehouse and be like, hey, tell tell Chief Rhodes he's wrong because he knows yeah. a whole lot more than you. So tell Smoke Daddy he doesn't know what he's talking exactly, about. Exactly right. <laughs> uh, yeah. It, it, we we have the power. You're right, and like you were saying from the from the from the meetup, or who, and I don't remember who said that, but um, yeah, it's, it's. I don't either. I don't it won't either. Take I wish seventy I could years, right? I think we can. I, I think it'll flip. We just need people like we just need these platforms, like outliers, to beat the drum of firefighters. Promote, yeah, and become a policymaker. Become a pol- be unapologetic, and like a lot of people aren't allowed. You're not allowed to use that term anymore because basically David Rhodes made it his, but unapologetic unapologetic about a fire first culture unapologetic that we will search every structure that we go to man just be unapologetic and take the fire service back from all the bean counters all the rule makers all the safety first uh i don't want to say nazis but yeah yeah (laughs) there you go yeah and and the other thing it's not without sacrifice and i think that that's one of the things that people got to realize right if you've got the will and you a lot of people say to firefighters, if you don't like it, promote, right, to lieutenant. and th- But that's where the conversation stops. It, it, it can't be that way. It's got to be, well, if you don't like it, promote to chief, to deputy chief, to district chief. It's the same thing, right? And and that does take sacrifice because I get to live it. I'm a firefighter. I, I am a firefighter at rank. That's what I do. And and I get to have a blast. And, and- but, and I want to be very clear. There's nothing wrong with being a firefighter, a badass firefighter, a badass senior man dedicated. But I've never met a badass senior man who wouldn't have made an amazing company officer, who wouldn't have. Like, I can go to any department right now and walk in and say, who's the guy that everybody points at and says, man, if that guy was our chief and he's a he's a he's a one stripe firefighter or whatever that, that's been there for 27 years. And there's one in every department like, no, if that guy right there was chief, this place would be so much better. Every department has them, man, like in spades. And, but there's nothing wrong because sometimes the system just doesn't work out, whatever the system is, but it's, there's so many that don't even try so many that don't even give the effort. Yeah. Uh, and that, that is the problem mm-hmm. with why we are at where we're at in, in the red but I firmly believe it's been triaged, and we got the bleeding stopped, and the people are beating the drum. Yeah, uh, uh, Kyle Kyle uh, Kondoff is saying Cody Trustdale. Absolutely, right? What a badass that dude that is, right? And he's a firefighter. He didn't promote, and it doesn't mean that he's not valuable. Definitely doesn't mean that. No, no, Any no, hundred percent imagination, right? But imagine Cody Trustdale running your department, right? Yeah, yeah. No, and and, and like I said, it's not because I, I don't want to say like Cody, you know, didn't promote for whatever reason. It doesn't matter. It's like we have to start promoting firefighters. Mm -hmm. Firefighters need to put their names out there to promote. Anyway. anyway. Or if you don't want to do it, and that's fine, right? Nothing wrong with that. Support someone that will, right? That is in your camp, that does get it, and help them get there. There's nothing wrong with that, right? You You can do whatever you want, but if you want those values, if you want your department to have that change and you see somebody that's that's on the up support them yeah but you can't scratch your head and go why are we here well we're here because firefighters are there's no firefighters making the rules i I forget brian brush quotes it all the time i think it's eus letikides or whatever uh, greek guy which says if you if your uh, warriors are separated from your scholars then your decisions will be made by cowards and your fighting will be done by i forget i'm butchering the quote immensely but the 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 the, the thing is, the theme is there of what has happened to the American Fire Service. We have promoted, we have not promoted our warriors for 70 years. And so our warrior culture is dead. And that's using the terms loosely of what I'm talking about, but 100%. Yeah. There you go. 100%. 100%. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, I loved it, brother. What else you got? I got I got one more here. And, and okay. And, and unless everybody's got something else to throw in there, please go for it. Um, what would you say the most important element is to end your career as positively as it began? The most important element. I would, uh, man, this is near and dear to my heart, actually, because I would say it's intentionality and and deliberate. I don't know. Those words are almost interchangeable. Just being in what am I, one of my company officers actually busts my chops all the time because I say be deliberate and in, deliberately intentional. 
And he's like, chief, that means the same thing. But intentionality. And what I mean by that is I watched a um, someone I respected immensely at the end of their career just kind of check out and – uh, and, and rightfully so for a lot of reasons, they put in a lot of time and, and done, you know, and, and finished their time, but they were not connected to the people. Uh, and they ended their career on a, on a very, not, it's not even a down note, just a disconnected note. And if you want to finish strong, man, you have to be intentional about staying connected to the young people that you are hiring. You have to be intentional. You have to be deliberate. You have to be deliberately intentional. I said it for you, co You have to be deliberately intentional about staying connected and building relationships with the young people coming in. Uh, Cause a weird thing happens. Like I, I'm, I'm, I'm in my head. I'm still a young man. You know, I'm, I'm still, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a hunk and a young man. But and the truth of the matter is this is there's, we've probably hired 20, 25 people now that have never known me as anything but chief more, which is weird to me because I'm just, you know, I'm just Corley. But to them, I'm Chief Moore. And I remember one time, I, I, man, I got on a, on a rant with one of my young guys on my phone and I was telling him, hey, you need to delete that comment. And I, I did this whole diatribe of busting what I thought was busting his chops about deleting this. And I, in my head, I sounded like Ron Burgundy or, or you know, uh, Talladega Nights. And, you know, that's what I sounded like. But man, I completely offended him. And he thought that I was like super pissed because his chief was saying all these things to him in a Ron Burgundy voice through text, which doesn't translate. Uh, and it was terrible. And he, and he actually came and talked to me about it. And I had to explain that. And so long story short is uh, be, be very intentional about building those relationships because if not, you'll be completely disconnected those last few years. You'll have no influence and be highly ineffective. So you have to do it intentionally because it will not happen on accident. The natural, the natural tendency is just to sink into complacency. So, and, and especially when you've been doing it for 30 years and your cup is full and you've seen enough, uh, it's easy to check out. And, but those young people need it. They need it. It's now more than ever. So. And that's actually everything I say, let me qualify this to everybody out there. Everything I say is preaching it myself. <laughs> Yeah, it really is. It's not directed outward. It's all directed in the mirror. So I had I had a um, uh, a, a thought. So after I read uh, Rhodes's article, right about um, I, I I don't remember what it was actually called, how he phrased it, but basically like anybody can kind of do what we're doing, right? Anybody right. can can develop some sort of following. Anybody can do that stuff. And, oh yeah, and it obviously it made me look back at myself of what, sure. what what I'm doing here, right? And and I realized like it's really easy for people to sit and listen to these things and think, you know, we got it all all the time, and we're you know our <laughs> departments are amazing, and there's right. absolutely nothing wrong, and I I don't eat a Snickers bar ever, and you know I, I'm I always say the right thing in every conversation, and I'm always insightful so far from it and uh i i posted something the other day trying to 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 articulate that to let people understand that like regardless of who you're listening to and myself included we're all fighting the same fight a lot of the things that i post on my page is my own internal self-talk it's my own positive self-talk like i've i had a buddy i was having you know rough time i texted him i was struggling you know some my passion for work and all that other stuff and he texts me all he does is send me a picture from my own site of something that i posted and i was like <laughs> yeah he's like thanks for that thank you like, <laughs> stick with what you remember the things that you're talking about so uh, like I, we're we're all dealing with our own you know suffrage i think was one of the things that uh, uh Rhodes said in his speech right we all have our own suffrage that we're yes. going through Nobody's perfect. So that's it, man. That's it. I love it. I love it. Is this the first vigilante interviewing a vigilante? Yeah, I think so. Or no, I think so. Fisher. I, Is it Rob Fisher? Win. Fisher's boy was the one of the originals. He's like number seven or so, number six. So I have interviewed Fisher. Yeah, but this is the first vigilante that not interviewed by me. That's a vigilante. Well, yeah. This there we is go. Somebody else. Yeah. Yeah. Another. Unless you've interviewed another vigilante. No, yeah, you're my first one outside of I don't, even Illinois. I was wondering. Um, I was wondering. That's dope. I've, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed it, brother. I hope 
it brought some value because yeah. I have a tendency to go on uh, diatribes that may or may not make sense. I'll listen to it later and no, see if it makes sense. No, it makes sense. I, that's that's and and then I I try to be structured, organic with what I do. That's why I send the right. questions ahead. That's why I try to you know have something so we can get off on tangents. I I am I'm a big training guy. I write lessons. I do a lot of those things. And one of the things that I try to do whenever I write a lesson is I write a half hour drill that I hope is so good that it becomes an hour drill. That's one of the things right. that I try to think about and the same thing I'm trying to apply it to here. So I mean we're at two hours. I love it. That's it. I love it. Dude it didn't feel like two hours. No it did so I hope in it. a good way. I mean uh other than otherwise uh hang out with me. We'll we'll go to the green room here in a sec. But and, okay. if anybody um uh, if they needed to get a hold of you, how could they do that? I posted your uh, website in the chat if, if anybody needed that. So how can people get a hold of you if they wanted f- more? Uh, anything social media is Firehouse Vigilance. Like you can find it almost anywhere. Firehouse Vigilance. Um, yeah, firehousevigilance.com if you want merch, if you want to join the vigilantes. Uh, the V90, it, it it's in beta. That's the thing is like so many people have asked, how can I get a book? How can I do V90? It's in beta. Like it's not even done yet. The the vigilantes are beta testing it, and they're going to make it better in ninety days. The new books, the final, the final first edition books, I guess, will be, whatever that's called, <laughs> the final will be out. So, uh, but no, firehousevigilance.com. Go there if you want books. Go to Amazon if you want them fast. Go to firehousevigilance.com if you want them signed. Uh, and that's it. That's easy. Done. <laughs> easy. And it works. I've reached out myself, so I I'm a <laughs> I can vouch yeah. for that. Uh, just some final closing things here, everybody. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Everybody says you, uh, we're we're kicking ass here, which is that's great. Thank you, Trevor. Uh, thank you guys for listening, and uh, I'll, I'll I'll see you in the next one. Um, I don't have Loved a, it. I don't have a sign off like I don't even know if you do. Now that I think about it, but either way, thanks for listening. Uh, what was this lucky number thirteen? I think for me, so that's pretty sweet. <laughs> I'm pretty happy about being number 13. Uh, you can have that. Yeah, that's. You can do it this way. You can say, I, I hope the tone stays silent unless it's burning. Everybody stay safe out there. Oh, man. There's the sign off. Absolutely. Uh, oh, no. Where's my button to shut us off? <laughs> stay safe out there. <laughs> keep, keep staying safe, everyone. All right. Have a good one, everybody. Bye. <laughs>